September 3, 1991. I figured living out here meant I wouldn't ever be the one with a bad day at the office. Story. Turns out I was wrong. Real wrong. My name's Rick. Spent years training guys to handle themselves in any hellhole on the planet. Now I'm the one in need of a damn survival course. After I called in about Thompson, there wasn't much to do but wait. Sun was going down, no sign of the sheriff. Decided to secure the cabin for the night. I patched the roof leak, checked the woodpile, the usual routine. But my gut churned, kept expecting something to come leaping out of the shadows. Had my rifle out, cleaned and ready. Can't say that's a normal evening activity around here. Night fell. The forest gets a whole different kind of quiet, not peaceful quiet, the kind that feels like something's holding its breath. I kept the fire low in the pit, didn't even try to sleep. Around three in the morning I heard it. Not a twig snapping, not the rustle of leaves you get with critters. It was more like a creak. A heavy, strained creak, like an old tree bending too far. Whatever made that sound was big. I doused the fire, kicked dirt over the embers. Didn't want a flicker of light giving me away. Then silence. I peered out into the darkness, rifle at the ready. Minutes stretched on. My heart hammered so loud I swore whatever was out there could hear it. Then I saw a flicker of movement up by the tree line. Not the low scuttling of an animal. This thing stood tall. I could see its silhouette against the sliver of moonlight, and it wasn't any shape I recognized. Not a bear, not even a moose. It stood on two legs, but its limbs were long, bent in a way that made my skin crawl. It cocked its head, like a bird trying to get a better look. I stayed frozen, barely breathing. It took a step closer than another. That creaking noise again, not branches, that was the sound of its joints moving. And that silhouette. I started to make out details. A lanky, twisted body, arms that hung past its knees, a head that seemed elongated. The damn thing was close enough now that I could smell it, a mix of rot and wet fur. It hissed, a low raspy thing that set my teeth on edge. And then, gone. It vanished back into the trees as quickly as it appeared. I waited until dawn before I moved, rifle gripped tight in my hands. First light, I made a sweep of the area. Tracks. Not bare paws or wolf prints. These were hand-like, long fingers ending in ragged claws and whatever made them carried serious weight. The depressions were deep. I followed the tracks. They led straight to where I found what was left of Thompson. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't just passing through. This was its hunting ground. And I was on the menu. The next few days were a blur of exhaustion and terror. I barely slept, jumping at every sound. I hunted only when absolutely necessary, moving quietly and making sure to leave minimal traces of my presence. The creature, because I didn't know what else to call it, seemed to toy with me. I found scraps of clothing in odd places, caught glimpses of it in the corners of my vision, and its stench lingered in the air, a constant reminder that it was always lurking. Then came the turning point. I was tracking a deer, trying to stock up on supplies, when I heard a scream cut through the forest. A human scream. Someone else was out here. Someone who was probably about to become this monster's next meal. I ran, rifle in hand, heart pounding. I found her at the edge of a clearing, a young woman, maybe early twenties. She was backed up against a tree, sobbing while the creature circled her. The damn thing was almost playing with its prey. I didn't think. I just acted. Leveled my rifle and fired a shot, 
more of a warning than anything. The creature whipped around, hissing and snarling. It was more animal than human, scrabbling on all fours, eyes glowing in eerie yellow in the twilight. The woman, her name was Sarah, she told me later, ran for it while I had the creature's attention. We sprinted deeper into the woods, not caring where, just away. I fired again, hitting the creature in the shoulder. It howled, an inhuman sound that chilled me to the bone. Sarah and I ran for what felt like hours, finally collapsing in a tangle of limbs when we couldn't go any further. We spent the night huddled together, sharing whispered stories and trying to stifle our sobs. As the sun rose, we made a plan. It was a desperate one, but our only chance. We found high ground, a rocky outcrop overlooking a large section of the forest. The creature's tracks had gone cold, but we knew it was still out there. Our plan, I'd act as bait, lure it into a position where Sarah could get a clean shot from the outcrop. It was suicide, basically. But the alternative was worse. I moved through the forest, making noise, leaving obvious signs of my passage. When I reached an open area, I waited. It didn't take long. That creaking sound echoed through the clearing, and the monster stepped into view. It stalked closer, eyes fixed on me. Sarah's rifle cracked, the shot ringing out. The creature stumbled, one of those clawed hands clutching its chest. I held my breath, waiting for it to drop. But it didn't. It turned its long head to stare up at the outcrop where Sarah was perched. Snarling, it charged. Sarah fired again and again. Each hit made the thing stagger, but it kept coming. It reached the base of the cliff, starting to scramble up, its movements horrifyingly agile. I watched in despair as Sarah backed away, her face pale. She fired her last shot, and the creature slumped, falling back down the rocks with a bone-jarring thud. It lay still, for all of two seconds. With a roar that shook the ground, it hauled itself back up, bloody but undeterred. Rick, run! Sarah's voice, barely above a whisper, cracked with desperation. I didn't need telling twice. I ran like hell itself was on my heels, dodging trees and leaping over fallen logs. Behind me, I heard the creature crashing through the undergrowth, its furious growls echoing through the woods. I don't know how long I ran, or where I ended up. Eventually, I collapsed, gasping for breath and unable to take another step. I expected the creature to descend on me at any moment, expected to feel those ragged claws sink into my flesh. But it never came. After a while, just the rustle of the wind and the call of birds filled the silence. I was alive. Tragic aftermath? That's my life now. Sarah and I found our way out of the wilderness, but what waited for us wasn't the world we knew. We tried to explain, to warn the authorities, but, well, have you ever tried telling someone a monster lives in the woods? You get those pitying looks, the referral to a nice therapist. Nobody believed us, except for the handful of others out there, the ones with haunted eyes who've looked into the abyss and seen it staring back. We formed a loose network, sharing information, warnings, whispers of sightings in remote places. They call it an urban legend, a campfire story, maybe it's safer for everyone that way. They don't know there are things in those dark spaces between the trees, things that wear the skin of nightmares. They don't know the strider is real. June 5th, 2008 Back then, I still thought I knew what it meant to be alone out here. Turns out, Ignorance is bliss. My name's Wyatt. Spent a decade in the Marines, 
worked some off-the-books security jobs after. Figured if anyone could make it living off-grid, it was me. Got myself a nice little cabin in the Alaskan backcountry, everything I needed. Or so I thought. First hint something was wrong came about two weeks in. I was making the rounds, checking trail cams, when I snagged one on a weird track. Not animal, not something I recognized. Looked like handprints, but too big, and the fingers were splayed wide. Thought maybe a hoax, some idiot messing with me. Figured I'd relocate that camera, see what else turned up. A day later, I hiked back to that spot. The camera was gone. No sign of struggle, no mess. Just vanished. Started feeling uneasy then. Not scared, mind you. Marines don't scare easy. But there was definitely that sense of something watching you from the trees. Kept telling myself I was imagining things. Went back to my routine, hunting, gathering supplies, the usual. Nights, though, nights were getting harder. I'd swear I heard noises outside the cabin, like a heavy footstep circling, or a scraping sound against the walls. I'd shine a light out the window and see nothing. Then came the bare carcass, or what was left of it. Found it half-eaten, stripped in a way no natural predator would. The meat was cut up neat, like with a knife. That's when I started keeping a loaded shotgun by the bed. One evening, I was chopping firewood when I heard it. A low, guttural growl from just inside the tree lean. Dropped my axe, grabbed the shotgun, and slowly moved towards the sound. That's when I saw it. Hunched between the trees, massive, hulking, but moving with creepy grace. Skin stretched tight over bones, making it look half-starved, and eyes that glowed like embers in the dim light. Its head was wrong, long, with a snout, and way too many teeth crammed in its jaw. We stood there for what felt like an eternity. It tilted its head, studied me. I raised the shotgun, but my hands shook. The thing wasn't scared, more curious. It hissed, showing those teeth, then it bolted back into the trees with unnatural speed. After that, there was no more denying it. Something was hunting me. I spent the next week fortifying my cabin, turning it into a damn fortress. Set traps around the perimeter, the heavy-duty kind. Figured even if I couldn't kill the thing, I might slow it down. One night it came. I heard a crash, one of the traps snapping shut on something big. Threw on my headlamp and looked out the window. There it was, snarling and thrashing as it tried to pull free. I aimed my shotgun, took a shaky breath, and squeezed the trigger. The blast knocked it back. It stumbled, roared, a sound that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck, then sprinted into the darkness. In the morning, I followed a trail of blood, but it just petered out after a while. Whatever that creature was, it wasn't something a gunshot could put down. I knew I couldn't stay. Packed up the bare essentials, left my cabin with a heavy heart. Hiked for three days straight until I found a road, flagged down a passing truck. The trucker got me to the nearest town, looked at me like I was crazy when I told him my story. Didn't care. Never went back to Alaska. Took me years to even look at a map of the place. They say some folks vanish out there without a trace every year. Hikers, hunters. Now I wonder if maybe they weren't lost. Maybe they were found, the same way I was. Think the locals probably have a name for that creature by now. Some old legend whispered around campfires. I call it the Skinner. March 23, 1997 
You think you know the woods, then the woods teach you a lesson. My name's Lucas. I did a bit of everything, construction, landscaping, odd jobs that kept me on the move. Living off the grid was about as normal to me as paying rent. Found this old hunting cabin tucked deep in the Ozarks. Seemed like a decent spot to hole up for a while. First few weeks were peaceful. Did some fishing, hiked the trails, fixed up the cabin. Locals in the nearest town gave me the side-eye sometimes, but mostly kept to themselves. One old-timer, Harlan, stopped by my place one afternoon. Brought me a pie his wife made, warned me about the wild dogs. He heard howling up in the hills at night. I thanked him, figured he meant coyotes. Then things got weird. Started with the rabbit. Found it half-eaten near my woodshed. The way the flesh had been torn looked wrong. Not like any predator I'd encountered. A few days later, I was tracking a deer when I spotted a smear of blood on the trunk of a tree, too high for any animal I knew. That night, the woods went crazy with howls, a chorus of them echoing all around me. Didn't sound like dogs, not exactly. Higher pitched, and there was an edge to it that set my teeth on edge. Next morning, I went looking for the source of the noise. Found Harlan's truck abandoned on a dirt track a couple miles from my cabin. The door was wide open, the inside torn apart, smeared with blood. No sign of Harlan anywhere, just a trail of bloodstains disappearing into the undergrowth. I called the sheriff from town, but he didn't sound too concerned. Old guy wandered off, probably get himself found in a day or two. I knew better. Whatever was out there, Harlan wasn't lost. He was hunted. The next week was the longest damn week of my life. Every night I bolted the cabin doors, laid out a perimeter of tin cans and fishing line to warn me if something approached. Kept my shotgun propped by the bed. Never caught more than a glimpse of the creature, though. A flash of movement in the trees, a pair of eyes glowing yellow in the darkness. It was toying with me, leaving half-eaten carcasses around, dragging branches across my roof at night howling until the hair stood up on my neck. I started to unravel. Barely slept, barely ate. Every time I stepped outside, I swore I felt that thing watching me. Then came the night Emily showed up. She was hiking the Ozark Trail solo, got herself turned around after dark. Came stumbling toward my cabin, crying and scratched up from the brambles. The second I saw her, I knew it was over. Whatever was out there wouldn't leave two of us alive. I should have sent her away, should have done anything but what I did. I let her in. We barred the doors, huddled together listening to those howls circle the cabin. I told her about Harlan, about the creature in the woods. She didn't believe me, not at first. Thought I was spooked by isolation. Then the roof creaked. Something massive leaped onto it with a thud that shook the whole cabin. That's when Emily understood. We heard it clawing at the windows, trying to get in. Its rasping breath against the glass made me want to throw up. Emily was sobbing, screaming for it to go away. I did the only thing I could think of, loaded my shotgun, flung open the door, and fired into the darkness. The creature howled, a scream of rage that cut through the night. There was a crash as it bolted off the roof and into the woods. We slammed the door shut, shoved furniture against it for good measure. I held Emily until her sobbing subsided. Didn't tell her I'd only had the one shell. In the morning, we packed everything we could carry and ran. Didn't stop until we hit pavement flagged down a car, and begged for a ride to the nearest bus station. Never looked back. When we told our story to the police, well, let's just say their response wasn't what we hoped for. 
They wrote it off as a bear attack, maybe a mountain lion with cubs. Emily went back home. Me, I couldn't go back to my old life. It all felt too small, too safe. I drift around now, work under the table jobs. Always keep an eye on the tree line. Folks might call me crazy, but they don't know. Out there, in the wild places, things like Harlan and Emily vanish every year. And I know damn well those things have a name. Out where the trees grow thick, folks whisper about the rake. October 10th, 2012 It started with a job. Figured it'd be an easy in and out. Mapping some old logging trails up in the Washington Cascades for a timber company. Get paid. Spend a few weeks in the woods. Sounded perfect to me. Name's Cole, by the way. Ex-Army. Did some wilderness training stuff after. Living off-grid ain't a hobby for me. It's a skill set. Landed myself a sweet little campsite by a creek, real secluded. First few days went smooth. Work was straightforward. The woods were the usual thick, rain-soaked Pacific Northwest tangle. Nights were quiet, except for the normal critter noises. But by the end of that first week, things started feeling off. Wasn't anything obvious, more a prickling at the back of my neck. That gut instinct you get after too many patrols in bad territory. Then I found the elk. It was half submerged in the creek, not more than a hundred yards from my camp. Hide stripped clean off, the meat carved away like it had been butchered. Didn't see any tracks that made sense, not with the way the carcass was torn up. Figured maybe a cougar got lucky, dragged its kill somewhere safer. Still... I slept with my rifle close that night. Couple days later, I was way off trail, marking a stand of old growth the company wanted surveyed. Found myself in a small clearing where something big had gone through, branches snapped high up, the ground churned to mud. And there, in the prints, were these massive, clawed footprints, definitely no bear or anything I recognized. The thing that made them was strong, heavy. I started backtracking, following the trail of destruction. That's when I heard it, the crack of a branch snapping, just ahead in the trees. I froze, rifle raised, but there was nothing to see in the thick undergrowth. The forest fell silent. Then, from somewhere behind me, came a low snarl that turned my blood cold. I turned, scanning the trees, that's when I saw it, crouched on a moss-covered boulder. Huge, looked like a mix of man and wolf, but twisted and wrong. Its skin was stretched tight over bone, almost translucent. Its eyes burned yellow in the dim light. We stared at each other, maybe ten seconds that felt like forever. My finger found the rifle's trigger, but something held me back. It wasn't just animal instinct. It was deeper, a primal dread that screamed at me this ain't natural. The creature lunged, and I fired on instinct. I remember the roar of my rifle, the bark shattering from trees. The creature jerked, then vanished into the undergrowth. I stumbled back, breathing ragged, heart pounding like a drum solo. Didn't stop to think just emptied the rifle in the direction I thought it had gone with a desperate yell. I knew then it wasn't over. Whatever that thing was, I'd pissed it off. Back at my camp, I packed up everything I could carry and booked it out of there. Didn't stop running until I found a road, flagged down a trucker who gave me a wide-eyed look but drove me to the nearest town. Called the job and sick told the timber company to forget about me mapping those woods. Figured they'd write me off as some nature kook. Didn't care. Never went back to the Cascades. That snarl echoes in my head sometimes, especially at night. 
Folks say Bigfoot's a myth, an old wives' tale to scare kids. I saw something out there, something that ain't in any guidebook. And in those woods, deeper than maps show and darker than men go, I reckon the locals have a name for it, the Wendigo. Let me tell you, the aftermath wasn't pretty. Couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, jumped at every shadow. Nightmares plagued me, the creature's blazing eyes, the hunger in its snarl. Tried to tell people, but they looked at me like I was crazy. Drank myself stupid for a while, trying to erase the memory. Didn't work. Eventually, I picked myself up, drifted from place to place. Never stay anywhere too long. Keep a rifle loaded, sleep with one eye open. I ain't the same guy who headed into those woods. Maybe that cold died back there in the clearing. Maybe the thing in the trees took a piece of me. But here's the thing about monsters. Once you know they're real, you can never go back to pretending they're not. Word gets around, even in the off-grid crowd. Met a guy in Montana last year, a Lakota elder at an off-season powwow. Heard my story and just nodded. Told me there are things in the deep places, old things with names only whispered around dying fires. We traded tobacco, shared a flask under the stars. He said, You saw a walker between worlds. Best you run and don't look back. Guess I'm still running. November 8, 2005 Found the perfect spot out in the main woods, figured it'd make a good winter camp. I'm Wes. Spent most of my adult life off-grid. Bit of a drifter, never stuck around any place too long. City life never agreed with me. Too much noise, too many people. Out here, it's just me and the trees. Set up a decent cabin, solid, kept the weather out. Did some hunting, filled my wood pile, all the usual prepping for when the snow really moved in. Then the locals started disappearing. One old-timer, Jeb, went out to check his trap lines and never came back. A week later, a couple hikers vanished off a popular trail. Search and rescue went in, but all they found was some trashed campsites. Folks started whispering about bear attacks gone bad, but I knew better. I'd seen enough predators to know this wasn't their style. It was around then I first spotted movement near my cabin. Never caught a good look, just flashes of something big and dark between the trees. I got that crawling feeling, like I was being watched. Heard noises at night too, snapped branches, something heavy circling my camp. Started sleeping with my shotgun by the bed. A few nights later, I woke to a sound like the whole damn forest was screaming. It was coming from the west, towards where Jeb and those hikers had gone missing. Grabbed my shotgun, stepped outside. The air hung heavy, smelling of wet fur and something sour underneath. I found Jeb's body half a mile from my cabin. What was left of him, anyway? It looked like something huge had ripped him apart, then dragged what remained through the brush. I dropped to my knees, puked right there in the snow. That's when I saw it, standing near the tree lean, watching. I only caught its silhouette against the moon, but that was enough. Tall, hunched, but moving on two legs. Its arms were too long, its head too big and pointed, like a wolf that got stretched wrong. I fired a shot, more to scare the thing off than anything. It roared, a sound that raised the hair on my neck, and bolted into the trees. I stumbled back to my cabin, bolted the door, and waited for dawn. First light, I packed my gear and got the hell out of there. Didn't stop until I hit the nearest highway, flagged down a passing truck. Told the driver some story about a botched hunting trip needed to get back to civilization. 
He gave me a long look but didn't ask questions. When I finally made it to a town, saw the news reports about Jeb and the hikers. They called it animal attacks, but I knew what was out there. That night, I lay in a cheap motel room, listening to the traffic rumble by, and swore I could still smell that creature on the wind. Maine was burned for me. I drifted south, started bouncing between odd jobs, construction, ranch hand work, stuff that kept me moving. Never went into deep woods again. I sleep with a loaded pistol under my pillow now, even in towns. See its shape in every shadow, hear its snarl in the back of my mind. City lights don't feel so crowded anymore, now that I know what darkness really hides. Folks around here, they've probably got their own names for it. Maybe some stories passed down from old-timers who saw it before, glimpsed it lurking on the edge of the campfire light. The locals in Maine, they called it the rake. August 21st, 1998 Figured moving down to the Ozarks would be the perfect reset. Little cabin, fresh air, a damn sight better than my last apartment in Chicago. Names Everett Worked as a mechanic most of my life. Figured my hands were better suited to fixing engines than people, so off-grid living made sense. First few weeks were peaceful. Did some repairs to the cabin, chopped wood, the usual. Hiked the trails, got to know the lay of the land. The Ozarks are a special kind of thick, deep ravines, caves cutting into the hillsides, trees so old they make you feel small. Found some good fishing holes too, even befriended an old local, Harlan, who showed me his favorite spots out on the lake. He spun tall tales about catfish the size of canoes and warned me away from a few places, old mines, cliffs with a nasty habit of crumbling. Figured those were just a way of making sure I didn't stumble onto his best spots. Then I found the deer. It was half-eaten, like something had gnawed on it then left the rest. Didn't find any tracks I recognized. No wolves, no mountain lions around here. Figured maybe a poacher got to it before gutting the thing properly. Nasty business, but nothing to get worked up about. A few days later, I was out hiking at dusk when I heard a scream cut through the woods. Sounded human, but high-pitched, full of terror. Ran towards the sound, heart pounding. Found a shredded tent at an abandoned campsite and blood smeared across the ground. No sign of whoever had been there. Called it into the sheriff's office when I got back to my cabin. They didn't seem too bothered, figured it was some kids messing around, getting spooked. That night, I started hearing noises outside. Branches snapping, something heavy brushing against the cabin walls. This wasn't raccoons or possums, this was big. I grabbed my hunting rifle kept it propped by the door. Didn't sleep a wink. Days turned into a tense blur. I'd hike out heavily armed, scanning my surroundings, ready to fire at anything that moved. Found more ripped-up campsites, animal carcasses torn open in ways I couldn't explain. Started to understand those whispers you hear in isolated places, about things that hide in the shadows. Then Harlan disappeared. His boat turned up adrift on the lake, some fishing gear scattered across the shore. Sheriff didn't launch a search party. Said he was probably just an old man who wandered off, got lost. I knew better. Whatever was out there had taken him. One afternoon, I was chopping wood when I saw it out of the corner of my eye. Hunched behind a tree, just inside the treeling. Tall and thin, with skin stretched too tight across its bones. Its limbs looked too long, bent at unnatural angles. Its eyes, big and yellow, stared straight at me. 
For a frozen second, we locked gazes. Then, it bolted back into the woods with impossible speed. That's when I knew I had to get out. Packed the bare essentials into my truck and drove like hell was chasing me. Didn't even look back when I crossed the Missouri border. Later, I did some digging. Turns out the Ozarks have their own old stories. Tales folks tell hushed up around campfires about something that stalks the hollows, something the locals call a high behind. They say it snatches you from the shadows, drags you back to its den to feed. Some say it can mimic voices, lure you into the trees. Part of me wondered if that's what I had heard that day, if that scream had been meant to draw me in. Some nights, I still wake up in a cold sweat, smelling wood smoke and hearing that scream echo in the silence. City life isn't so bad after all. Got a new job, a tiny apartment, and the constant rumble of traffic is the most comforting lullaby I know. Out there, in those wild, lonely places, some things are better left undisturbed. Now, when anyone tells me they're thinking about living off-grid, I tell them my story. Most folks brush it off, but a few, well, I see something flicker in their eyes, a flash of recognition, like maybe, just maybe, they believe there are monsters hiding in the dark woods, beyond the edges of the map. March 18th, 2011. Found a piece of land way out in the Idaho backcountry and figured that was as good a place as any to settle down. Call me Jake. Ex-military, bounced between odd jobs after getting discharged. Figured living off the grid was the best way to get some peace and quiet, put those skills to use. The cabin was a fixer-upper, but it had good bones. I spent the first few months patching holes, building a proper outhouse, the basics. Explored the area too, dense pine forests cut through by ravines, an old creek snaking through the property. The locals in the nearest town weren't too friendly to a newcomer, but I was used to keeping to myself. Then the cattle started disappearing. Ranchers in the area found their herds with half-eaten carcasses scattered around. Some blamed wolves or coyotes, but the way the animals were butchered didn't add up. One night, I was working late fixing up the porch when I heard a low growl from the tree lean. Shine my flashlight out there, but didn't see anything. My survival instincts kicked in, that old feeling of being watched from the shadows. A few days later, I found Jedediah, the rancher whose land bordered mine. He was face down in the creek, torn apart like something savage had been at him. The sheriff came out, took some photos, and chalked it up to a bear attack. Said a big old male could get desperate, turn aggressive. I didn't buy it. Knew it wasn't any bear I'd ever seen. That night, I built a roaring bonfire in the clearing, strung floodlights around the cabin, and loaded every firearm I owned. Didn't sleep a wink, just sat there with my shotgun gripped tight, waiting for whatever was out there to show itself. It never did. For weeks, an uneasy silence settled over the area. The ranchers stopped losing cattle. Jedediah's death was brushed under the rug. I thought maybe whatever it was had moved on. I was wrong. I was out by the creek checking my fishing lines when I saw it. Crouched on a boulder, maybe fifty feet away. Tall, with long limbs that seemed to bend at unnatural angles. Its skin was leathery, stretched tight over bone. The head was wrong. Too big, the jaw too long. And the eyes, those damn yellow eyes that blazed in the twilight. I fumbled for my rifle, but the thing was gone in a flash disappearing into the trees with unsettling speed. That night I heard it circling the cabin. The howls it made were nothing like any animal I knew, a mix of a scream and a snarl that chilled my blood. 
I fired blindly into the darkness, more to vent my terror than anything else. It didn't stop the howling. Didn't stop until dawn. The next morning, I started packing. I abandoned the cabin, left most of my supplies. Took just the essentials and my guns. Figured speed was my best bet against that thing, whatever it was. I ran until I found a road, flagged down a passing logging truck, and told the driver I'd lost my way while hiking. I never looked back. The city feels crowded after the woods, but I don't miss the silence anymore. Don't miss the feeling of those eyes watching from the dark. Sometimes, late at night, I think I hear a howl echoing down the street, mixed in with the sirens and traffic. I tell myself it's just the wind. Folks around here, they have their own stories about backwoods monsters, things that snatch folks in the night. Some call it a wendigo, others just say it's a skinwalker. Me, I don't know what the hell it was. But I know one thing, out there, in those wild, lonesome places, the maps don't tell the whole story. July 9th, 2007 It started with a job offer, one of those too-good-to-be-true propositions. Some private contractor wanted a skilled surveyor with wilderness experience to map a stretch of untouched forest in the Washington Cascades. Paid well, room and board in a remote company-owned lodge. Name's Wyatt. Spent a few years bouncing between forest service jobs, so this seemed like a good fit. The flight up was the first hint something was off. The old bush pilot dropped me off by this massive, sprawling lodge, built way out in the middle of nowhere. No roads, no trails anywhere nearby. The place looked like it hadn't been used in years. Figured the company maybe used it as a base camp for logging crews a long time back. Inside was a mess, papers strewn everywhere, broken furniture, like something violent had gone down there. But I had a job to do, so I ignored the prickle of unease down my spine and started getting my gear sorted. The first few days went okay. I was hiking out solo, marking coordinates, getting a feel for the terrain. Up there, the woods have a way of getting inside your head, all those ancient trees and the heavy silence. One afternoon, cutting a traverse along a ridge, I found an old, overgrown trail. Figured it must have been an abandoned logging road, but something about it felt unnatural. The ground was churned up, and there were these massive footprints pressed into the mud. Didn't match any animal track I recognized. That night, back at the lodge, I was studying my maps when I heard it, a rustling sound from upstairs. It was definitely something big, moving on the old wooden floors. I froze, heart pounding in my throat. Then came a crash, and a low snarl that rumbled like thunder. Barricaded myself in one of the downstairs rooms, an old rifle I'd found stashed in a closet clutched in my hands. Whatever it was, it pounded against the door, splintering the wood. I fired a shot through the window, mostly to scare the thing off. The woods fell silent for a long, terrifying moment. Then, from somewhere behind the lodge, came a howl that made the hair stand up on my neck, a long, mournful, chilling sound. I didn't stick around to find out what made that noise. Left most of my gear, just bolted through the trees under the cover of night. Didn't stop running until I found a logging road and flagged down a passing truck. Told the driver I was with a survey crew and got separated. Needed a ride to the nearest town. He looked at me funny, but took me anyway, no questions asked. When I got back to civilization, I tried looking up that contracting company. Didn't exist, not under the name they gave me. Then the story started, 
rumors about hikers disappearing in those woods, whispers about strange sightings. I pieced it together, the abandoned lodge, those unnerving footprints, the creature howling in the night. It had all been a setup. They were luring folks out there, using them. For what? I didn't want to find out. A couple weeks later, I was in a bar, trying to drown out the memories, when an old, grizzled Native American guy sat down beside me, ordered a whiskey, then looked me dead in the eye. You saw it, didn't you? He asked in a low voice. The Sasquatch. I almost choked on my drink. The words sounded ridiculous, like something from a bad B-movie. He nodded, like he knew what I was thinking. People got different names for it. My tribe called it SX Wakewees. The wild man says it's been out there a long time, watching, hunting. Most folks don't pay attention to the old stories, but those woods, they hold secrets deeper than any map shows. The memories came flooding back, the creature's snarl, the way it pounded on the door, its inhuman howl echoing through the night. Why? I managed to choke out. Why lead people out there? The old man took a long swig of his whiskey. Some things, they ain't meant for our understanding. Best thing you can do is what you already did, run, and don't ever look back. I ain't been back to the Cascades since. Get the itch sometimes, miss the clean smell of the forest, the thrill of exploring new territory. But there's a kind of darkness that clings to those mountains now, something I can't shake. Some nights, lying awake in my cheap apartment, I swear I can still hear that mournful howl carried on the wind. October 23, 1993 I always liked figuring out how things worked, so when my truck broke down halfway between nowhere and gone, the first thing I did was laugh. Guess living in a cabin out in the Alaskan wilderness meant getting used to fixing my own problems. My name's Silas. Ex-mechanic, looking for some quiet after too many years spent under greasy hoods. Popped the hood, started poking around. Engine wasn't making the usual bad noises, which meant an electrical glitch somewhere. While tracing wires, I heard a crash, like something big moving through the trees. Figured it was a moose, not uncommon around these parts. Kept my head down, figuring it would wander off. Then I smelled it, a sharp metallic tang, mixed with something rotten, like a gut pile left out too long. The hairs on my neck stood up. Whatever it was, it wasn't a moose. I eased slowly away from the truck, keeping an eye on the tree lean. That's when I saw it. Hunched between two pines, easily eight feet tall. Covered in coarse, dark fur with a matted mane running down its back. Its long arms seemed to drag on the ground as it moved, and its head sat low on its shoulders, snout too long and pointed. But it was the eyes that got me, yellow and slitted, gleaming with a cold intelligence. I stumbled backwards, tripping over a root. The creature let out a snarl like metal scraping metal, and lunged. I scrambled to my feet, booked it towards the cabin, heart pounding so loud I was afraid the thing would hear it over my ragged breaths. I could hear it crashing through the undergrowth behind me, its snarls getting closer. My cabin wasn't much, one room, a wood stove, some basic supplies, but the door was solid. Slammed it shut, through the deadbolt, and collapsed, gasping for air. Outside, I heard the creature slamming against the walls, the hinges groaning ominously. It circled the cabin for hours, the rasping of its claws against the wood a constant, grating torment. As the sun began to set, the noises finally subsided. I didn't risk moving until full daylight. 
Opening the door, I saw the damage. Walls scored deep. The window by the woodpile cracked. And in the muddy ground, footprints. Not human, not bare, but clawed and heavy, too long for anything I recognized. I took a steadying breath and went to work. Boarded up the broken window, reinforced the hinges on the door. I left the deadbolt off. If the thing came back, I didn't want it trapped inside with me. That afternoon, I hiked out to my emergency supply cache, stashed a few miles away. Grabbed spare ammo, my old military-issue survival kit, and shouldered the heavy pack. The truck sat where I left it, the hood still up. I did a quick repair on the busted ignition wires, good enough to get it rolling, packed the essentials, and got the hell out of there. Stopped at the nearest town with a general store. Told the owner I'd been chased off by a brown bear, needed some ammo for my rifle. He eyed me suspiciously, but sold me the shells. Locals around here are used to keeping to themselves. Maybe they've seen things too, things they don't put a name to. Never went back to that cabin. Even now, truck engines don't rattle me the way the sound of claws on wood does. Sometimes out on the road, when the shadows stretch long across the asphalt, I catch a whiff of that rotten meat smell and a shiver runs down my spine. I look in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see a hulking shape, eyes gleaming in the twilight. I got a small trailer now, the kind you can tow behind a truck. Keep it packed and hitched up. I still take mechanic jobs for folks in remote towns, but I never stay too long. They call me a drifter, and I suppose they're right but sleeping behind a different steering wheel every night feels a whole lot safer. Folks up here, some of the old-timers, they whisper stories of the Adlet, a creature from Inuit legends, a monstrous mix of man and wolf. Maybe that's what I saw. Maybe it has other names, in other places, other shadowed corners of the map. All I know is, out there in the wild lonesome places— there are things older than our names for them, with a hunger that doesn't care what we call them back. November 12, 2009 I was never much for city life, the crowds, the noise, the feeling like just another rat in the maze. So, when I got the opportunity to buy a chunk of land in the remote boundary waters up in Minnesota, I jumped at it. Call me Lucas. Ex-logger, spent enough of my life in the woods to know my way around an axe and a chainsaw. Figured I could build a cabin, live off the grid, and leave the rat race behind. First summer went smooth. Got the cabin built on a ridge overlooking a small lake did some fishing, cleared trails quiet life, but that's the way I liked it. Come fall, things started to feel, off. I'd wake up to strange noises at night, snapping branches, heavy footsteps circling just outside the cabin. One morning I found massive footprints in the mud by the fire pit, bigger than any humans. Figured it was a bear, maybe getting bold with winter coming. Reinforced the cabin doors, kept my rifle handy. Then Pete went missing. He had a place a few miles over, another off-gridder. We'd trade supplies sometimes, share a beer on his porch. Went to check on him one day, found his cabin torn open like a sardine can. Blood was smeared on the walls, and there were those same massive footprints leading into the woods. Never found Pete's body. Word spread through the backwoods network. Some folks whispered bear attack, others muttered something about Bigfoot. Me, I wasn't sure what to believe, but I knew one thing, whatever was out there was dangerous. I started seeing it around then, just glimpses out of the corner of my eye. Hulking shape moving between trees, always just beyond the edge of the firelight at night. 
It was tall, bipedal, covered in dark hair. But its movements were wrong, too jerky, and its eyes, they shone yellow in the dark, like an animal's but with a cold intelligence that made my blood run cold. One evening, I was chopping firewood when I heard it growl, a low, rumbling sound that sent chills down my spine. Dropped my axe, bolted for the cabin, and slammed the door shut. It pounded against the walls, shaking the whole structure. I huddled inside, rifle clutched in my trembling hands, listening to its enraged howls echo through the night. That's when I knew I couldn't stay. I waited until dawn, then packed every essential I could manage into my old truck and got the hell out of there. Didn't even look back as I bounced down that rough logging road. Made it to the nearest town, told the sheriff some story about a wild animal getting into my cabin. He gave me a long, skeptical look. Maybe he didn't buy it. Maybe he did but figured it was best some things get left unsaid. Never went back to those woods. Sold the land for a pittance. Figured it was the price of my life. Now I drift between odd jobs, sleep in cheap motels, never getting too comfortable. City lights don't seem so bad anymore. At night, lying awake listening to the traffic rumble by, I sometimes swear I hear a deep, guttural growl out in the alleyway, and the faint echo of footsteps that aren't quite human. Out on the interstate, I sometimes imagine I see a hulking shape out of the corner of my eye, loping through the trees just beyond the tree lean, its yellow eyes fixed on my taillights. There's a name the locals up in the Boundary Waters have for it, the Wendigo. They say it's a spirit of hunger, an ancient thing that stalks the deep woods. I don't know what the hell it is, but I know this. There are places humanity was never meant to tread, where the shadows grow long, and old things still linger. My mistake was thinking I could escape them. March 26, 1991 Folks always asked why I chose to live off-grid way out in the Gila wilderness. Truth is, after a few too many years in the military, cities gave me the itch. I needed the quiet, the wide-open spaces. Names Garrett, ex-army ranger. New survival skills, knew how to handle myself. Figured I'd make it work. Built myself a small, sturdy cabin, did some odd jobs for ranchers when I needed supplies. Life was simple, just the way I liked it. Then the disappearances started. A hiker vanished from a trailhead, then an old prospector who had a shack deeper in the mountains. Search parties found nothing, not even a trace. Folks whispered about mountain lions, grizzlies gone rogue. I wasn't so sure. Been around predators all my life, and something about this felt different. It was on a supply run to the nearest town that I first saw the tracks. They were massive, bigger than any bear print I'd ever seen, and shaped all wrong. Claws looked longer, and the thing moved on two feet. I followed them for a ways, the unsettling feeling in my gut growing stronger. That's when I found the remains of a deer carcass, half-eaten, stripped of flesh in a way no natural predator would do. Back at my cabin, I started taking precautions. Reinforced the doors and windows, kept my guns loaded and within reach. Nights were the worst. I'd lie awake, listening to the rustling outside, the snaps of branches that sounded too heavy to be an animal. My dog, Bear, a big German shepherd, never left my side and would growl constantly at the darkness just beyond the firelight. One night it came. I was jolted awake by Bear barking furiously. Before I could reach my rifle, I heard a crash as something slammed into the cabin wall. The whole structure shook. Bear lunged for the window, 
and then came a scream that cut through me, not an animal's scream, but something chillingly close to human. I stumbled for the rifle, hands shaking, and peered out the window. What I saw will haunt me forever. It was enormous, easily eight feet tall, covered in matted fur that stank of rot. Its limbs were too long, bent at unnatural angles, and its head, it looked almost like a wolf, but twisted and wrong, with teeth longer than my hand. Its eyes blazed like embers in the darkness. I fired again and again, the roar of the rifle deafening in the small cabin. The creature seemed to stagger, then darted back into the trees with blinding speed. Bear burst out the door, chasing after it, barking madly. I hesitated only a second before snatching up my pack and following. I couldn't leave him out there with that thing. The trail was easy to follow in the moonlight. We found Bear a short distance away. What was left of him, anyway? It had torn him apart with savage brutality. Grief and fury surged through me, but I kept a clear head. Whatever this thing was, it was dangerous, and I needed to survive. I tracked the creature for the rest of the night, the blood trail eerily luminous in the dark. By dawn, the trail had petered out, and it seemed to have vanished. Exhausted and heartsick, I knew I couldn't stay. I abandoned my cabin, leaving behind most of my possessions. Never even looked back as I stumbled toward the nearest road. Found my way to a ranger station, told them some wild story about getting lost and attacked by a bear. I could see they didn't believe me, but they were more concerned than skeptical. Turns out, those disappearances had continued. Now that I described the creature, some of the old-timers started whispering stories, legends of a skinwalker from Navajo lore. I don't know what I believe, only what I saw. I live in a cramped apartment in the city now. Hate every minute of it, but every time I close my eyes I see that twisted wolf face leering at me from the darkness, smell that rotten stench, hear bear's dying scream. I'm saving up, looking for land somewhere a bit less remote, somewhere I can build a bunker alongside my cabin, stock it with supplies. Because I know, deep down, that thing is still out there. It might be years, even decades, but someday, it'll come for me again. And next time, I'll be ready. July 11, 2016 Figured getting away from the rat race and living off the land would be my salvation. Ex-cop, seen too many dark sides of humanity. Got myself a plot in the remote Ozark Mountains, built a cabin, learned the ways of the woods. Everyone called me Miller, never asked too many questions about my past. Summer went fine. Hiked the hills, spent evenings on the porch watching the sunset, felt that peace I'd been craving start to seep back into me. Things changed come fall. First, it was the cattle on neighboring ranches going missing. Ripped apart, half-eaten, not like any predator I recognized. Then old Elias, a hermit who lived deeper in the hills, vanished. Folks started whispering about wild hog attacks, even panthers getting desperate with winter approaching. But I knew better. Had enough experience with crime scenes in my past life to recognize something else at work, something wrong. One crisp November morning I found it. Tracks by the creek, bigger than any man's, with claws that looked longer than my damn fingers. That's when the nightmares started. Not just dreams, but waking visions, a flash of teeth, a hulking shape moving at a natural speed through the trees, the feeling of being watched. I started sleeping with a loaded shotgun by my bed, feeling crazy and paranoid but knowing deep down I wasn't imagining things. Then came the night I finally saw it. 
woke to branches snapping outside, the hair prickling on the back of my neck. The moon was bright, casting long shadows, and that's when I saw it hunched by the tree line. Too tall to be a bear, even standing on its hind legs. Covered in ragged fur, with a face like a starved dog stretched long and twisted. But the eyes, those damn yellow eyes burned with a hungry light that could chill your soul. We locked eyes for a long, horrifying moment. Then it lunged. Before I could grab the shotgun, it smashed through my window, glass flying everywhere. I scrambled backwards, fumbling for the gun, but it was on me, knocking me to the ground. Its claws raked across my chest, tearing my shirt, leaving burning gashes on my skin. The smell hit me then, like rotting meat and something sulfurous underneath. Not animal, not human. I shoved it back with a desperate surge of adrenaline, rolled away, and managed to fire the shotgun. Buckshot tore into the thing's shoulder, and it let out a howl that split the night, a sound both animal and horribly, brokenly human. It staggered back, then vanished into the trees, leaving a trail of dark blood. I patched myself up as best I could, then waited with shaking hands for dawn. By first light I had my gear packed. Never even looked back at the cabin as I drove away. Figured that thing would track me eventually, and I wasn't sticking around to find out when. Got a construction job in the city. Hate the noise, the crowds, but I sleep on a ratty mattress on a grimy floor with a bolted door between me and the world. Every time I see a shadow move too fast out of the corner of my eye, my heart thuds. Every time I smell something rotten, that putrid stench from the woods comes flooding back. Some nights, I think I hear a scratching at the window, and a ragged, howling cry that pierces through the traffic noise. Nobody believes me when I try to tell them what's out there. Maybe it's better that way. They say ignorance is bliss, but some kinds of knowing scar you deeper than any wound. Folks up here have stories of Ozark collars, things that stalk the dark hollers and prey on the lost and the weak. I don't know what that thing was, don't even want to think about it too much. All I know is, I survived, and some aren't so lucky. June 5th 2008. Found my slice of paradise up in the remote Boundary Waters canoe area, a little spot on the edge of a pristine lake, perfect for a self-sufficient man to make his home. Ex-Marine, name's Wyatt. Spent too many years fighting other people's wars, figured I deserved some solitude. So I built a cabin, got myself set up, spent my days fishing, foraging, leaving the rat race behind. Started hearing the rumors around that fall. A couple campers gone missing, whispers in the nearest town about wolves out of season or maybe a bear gone rogue. I didn't put much stock in it. Figured folks get lost out in the wilderness sometimes. Accidents happen. Then I found the remains. It was Jed, another off-gridder with a cabin a few miles over. He'd been a grizzled old coot, kept to himself mostly, but we'd swap supplies and stories sometimes. His cabin looked like it had been exploded, logs torn apart, the whole place reeking of blood. Found what was left of Jed near the lake shore. It wasn't any animal attack I'd ever seen. His body was ripped to pieces, half-eaten, like something huge and ravenous had gotten hold of him. That's when the fear started gnawing at my gut. If it could do that to Jed, then none of us out here were safe. I started fortifying my cabin, keeping my rifle loaded at all times. Nights were the worst. Sleep came in snatches, every rustle of leaves setting my heart pounding. I'd lie there, listening to the unnatural silence of the woods, 
knowing something was out there watching. One night I saw it. Full moon painted the landscape silver, and I was chopping wood by the cabin when I caught movement from the tree lean. It stood silhouetted against the night, massive, even on two legs. Thick, coarse fur clung to its powerful frame, and its head was long, almost wolf-like, but the proportions were all wrong. Its glowing yellow eyes fixed on me, and a primal scream echoed through the night. I barely made it inside the cabin before it charged. The impact against the door rattled my bones, and I could hear its ragged breathing and guttural snarls right outside. I fired through the window, again and again, the roar of gunfire deafening in the small space. It roared in pain but didn't retreat. Seemed to get even more enraged. The siege lasted for what felt like hours. It tore at the walls, trying to claw its way in. Each thud and splintering of wood sent me scrambling further back into the cabin. Then, just as abruptly as it started, the noises stopped. An eerie silence settled over the clearing. I didn't sleep a wink that night, just waited with my rifle clenched and white-knuckled hands for the onslaught to resume. By morning... The only evidence of the creature was the ravaged ground around my cabin and the lingering coppery stench of blood. I knew right then I couldn't stay. Packed my essentials and abandoned everything else. Drove for hours without looking back. Found a motel on the edge of civilization and holed up there for a week. Every time the wind rustled the curtains, I jumped, half expecting to see those glowing eyes peering in at me. I couldn't shake the image of Jed's remains, the creature's monstrous form in the moonlight. Eventually, I forced myself to get moving again. I drift from city to city now, never staying too long. Call me paranoid, call me crazy, but that thing is still out there. I see it sometimes, in the shadows at the edge of my vision, lurking on deserted streets late at night. I hear its ragged breathing in the alleyways, smell its rotten stench carried on the wind. Folks in the Boundary Waters whisper stories about a Wendigo, a ravenous spirit from old lore. Maybe that's what it is, maybe it's something else entirely. All I know is that there are things in this world that don't fit into our understanding, things that lurk in the deepest shadows of the wild. And some of us, we see them, they mark us in a way folks who live safe within city walls can never comprehend. October 17, 1997 Always been a bit of a loner, so when I got the opportunity to buy a chunk of land way out in the Gila wilderness in New Mexico, I jumped at it. Call me Lucas. Ex-military, saw enough of the world to know I preferred the quiet life. Built myself a small cabin, did some odd jobs for supplies kept to myself. Figured a man could find peace and solitude out there. Until the killing started. First, it was a rancher on the edge of the wilderness, found torn apart near his livestock pens. Sheriff chalked it up to a bear attack gone wrong, but folks around here knew better. Something was out there hunting, something that left tracks bigger than any bear I'd ever seen. Then old Elias, a prospector who lived up in the hills, vanished without a trace. Found some of his belongings scattered by a creek, stained dark with blood. Whispers turned to fear, fear to a sort of grim determination. This was our home, and we weren't about to be driven off by some thing. We started hunting it, organizing armed patrols through the woods. I went with them a few times, my military training kicking back in. Never saw a hide nor hair of the creature, but the woods felt off, oppressive, like we were being watched by something unseen. One day, I was out hunting for deer to stock up for winter when I saw it crouched on a ridge, watching me. It was tall, too tall to stand fully upright, 
with leathery skin stretched tight over bone. Its limbs looked too long, bent at unnatural angles, and its head was a wolf skull stretched and pulled into a monstrous parody, rows of jagged teeth bared in a snarl. But the eyes, those yellow eyes held a chilling intelligence. We stared at each other for a long, horrifying moment. Then it uncoiled, moving with impossible speed, and vanished into the dense trees. I bolted back to my cabin, heart thundering in my chest, and loaded every firearm I owned. The siege lasted for hours. I heard it circling the cabin, raking its claws against the walls, its ragged breathing mingling with the howling wind. I huddled on the floor, rifle clutched in my trembling hands, whispering old prayers and willing the sun to rise. When dawn finally came, I cautiously peered out the window. The ground was ripped to shreds, and a dark stain marked the cabin wall where the creature had battered it. But it was gone. It could have torn me out and devoured me in seconds, but for reasons I couldn't fathom, it didn't. From that day on, I was never the same. Couldn't shake the feeling of being hunted, the knowledge that something monstrous lurked in the shadows just beyond my sight. After a month of sleepless nights and constant dread, I packed my things and left the wilderness, never looked back. Found a cramped apartment in a dusty border town. Hate the noise, the crowds, the constant feeling of being exposed. I keep a loaded shotgun by the bed but I know deep down it would do no good if that thing ever found me again. Some nights, lying awake in the stale city air, I think I hear its snarl carried on the wind, and the scent of rot and damp fur tickles my nose. It knows where I am. It's only a matter of time until it comes for me. The locals where I lived had a name for it, the Skinwalker. They say it's a creature of Navajo legend, a shapeshifter filled with ancient malice. I don't know what to believe anymore. Only that pure evil has touched my life. That out there, in the vast untamed wilds, something waits in the darkness, forever hungry. August 21st, 1999. Wanted to get away from it all. The frantic pace of city life. The constant noise. The feeling of being just another cog in some giant, uncaring machine. Found a piece of land tucked into the Ozarks. Built myself a cabin. Figured I could live a simple, peaceful life out there. Call me Wyatt. Ex-Army Ranger. But you wouldn't guess that looking at me now, chopping wood in my faded flannel and worn jeans. First year went by quiet enough. Hunted, fished, got to know the rhythms of the woods. Then people started disappearing. Ezra, a grizzled old trapper who kept to himself, gone without a trace from his shack deeper in the hills. Couple hikers vanished from a popular trail. Search parties turned up nothing. Whispers started amongst the scattered folks out here, wild hogs getting bolder, or maybe a mountain lion with a taste for human flesh. I tried to brush it off, but a sense of unease started to prickle at the back of my neck. Something wasn't right. Those disappearances felt different, too clean, too calculated. Then I found the deer carcass. Half-eaten, stripped of flesh in a way no predator I knew would do. And beside it, the tracks, larger than a bear's, with claws that looked longer than my damn fingers. That's when the dread settled deep in my gut. Something unnatural was out there. I started taking precautions, secured my cabin, kept my rifle loaded at all times. Nights were the worst. The woods seemed to go deathly still, and I'd swear I could hear ragged breathing, rustling footsteps just beyond the feeble ring of firelight. Finally, it came for me. Woke up to a noise like branches snapping. 
The full moon painted the clearing outside my cabin in an eerie silver glow, and that's when I saw it. Hunched by the tree line, it was easily eight feet tall, covered in matted fur. It had a wolf-like head, but twisted and wrong, its muzzle stretched out too long, full of gleaming teeth. The eyes, those damn yellow eyes burned with a hungry intelligence that made my blood run cold. I fumbled for my rifle, fired a shot that rang out in the night. The thing snarled, a bone-chilling sound, and bolted upright. For a terrifying moment, I thought I was dead. It charged, moving with blinding speed. The door splintered under its impact, and I barely scrambled out the back window. I ran for what felt like hours, the creature's ragged snarls and the crashing of its pursuit echoing through the trees. Finally, just when I thought I couldn't run another step, I stumbled onto a logging road, flagged down a passing truck. Didn't even look back at the tree line, just threw my pack into the truck bed and collapsed, gasping for breath. The trucker gave me a long, suspicious look but drove me to the nearest town. I reported the attack to the sheriff, some half-baked story about a bear gone rogue. He didn't buy it, but what could he do? I didn't stick around to find out. Never set foot in those woods again. Now I drift from one cheap motel to the next, always on the edge of town, where the darkness doesn't feel quite so vast and ancient. Every rustle of leaves sets my heart pounding. I catch glimpses sometimes, a hulking shape out of the corner of my eye, and the rotten stench of it wafts through my nightmares. City lights don't feel so bad anymore. At least the monsters here have human faces. Out there in the wild, lonely places, there are things far older and more terrible lurking in the shadows. I ran from it, but I don't think I'll ever truly escape. Maybe when it finally corners me, maybe then I'll find out what the locals call it, the Ozark Collar, or something older still. November 8, 2003 Figured I'd earn some peace and quiet after ten years in the Marines. Got myself a remote plot of land up in the Boundary Waters, pristine wilderness on the edge of Minnesota. Figured I could build a cabin, live a simple life, fish, hunt, leave the world behind. Name's Garrett. First summer went smooth enough. Got the cabin built, Felt that bone-deep contentment a man gets from living off the land, providing for himself. Then the disappearances started. A park ranger, a couple of campers on an extended hike, all vanished without a trace. Search parties combed the woods, turned up nothing. Folks whispered about cougars, wolves getting bolder with winter coming on. I wasn't so convinced. One crisp fall morning... I stumbled across the reason why. Found what was left of Jedediah, another off-gridder a few miles over. Jed was tougher than a boiled boot, could track anything and knew the woods like the back of his hand. What I found of him was strewn across his campsite, like a wild animal had, had exploded him. Blood was splattered all over and his half-eaten remains looked like nothing I'd seen in all my tours overseas. The worst part were the footprints. Huge, clawed things, bigger than any humans. That's when I knew something unnatural was out there, something that didn't fit our understanding of the world. I bolted back to my cabin, barricaded myself in, rifle clutched in sweaty hands. Figured it was just a matter of time before it came for me. Nights were sheer hell. Every crack of a branch, every rustle of the wind had me jumping, thinking it was that thing circling, hunting. I saw it once, a hulking shape under the pale moonlight, its eyes reflecting back at me like glowing embers. It was easily eight feet tall, covered in coarse fur, 
with a muzzle stretched into a horrifying parody of a wolf's. That snarl echoed through my nightmares. The siege went on for days. It battered at the walls, tore at the roof, its ragged breathing a constant soundtrack to my terror. I barely slept, barely ate, just huddled in a corner, firing my rifle blindly whenever I thought it got too close. Maybe it was playing with me, like a cat with a mouse, or maybe it simply couldn't find a way in. Either way, I knew I wasn't going to last much longer. Finally, on the fifth night, the noises stopped. Dead silence fell over the forest. I waited for hours, nerves screaming, but the thing never returned. At dawn, I cautiously ventured outside, rifle at the ready. The ground around the cabin was shredded, but there was no sign of the creature. I didn't stick around to find out if it would come back. Left everything behind, just started walking. Hitchhiked, hopped freight trains, did whatever it took to get as far away from that place as possible. Ended up in a crummy apartment in a nameless city, surrounded by noise and concrete, a world away from the life I wanted. Sometimes, lying here in the stale city air, I almost miss the quiet of the woods. But then I remember Jedediah's remains, the creature's blazing eyes in the darkness, its bone-rattling snarl. I remember the feeling that I wasn't being hunted like prey, but by something far more intelligent, something that enjoyed the thrill of the chase. No, the city's fine with me. I don't sleep much, and I jump at every shadow, but at least the monsters here wear human faces, ones you can understand, plan against. Out there in the wild, lonely places, there are horrors older than cities, older than humanity. And the worst part is, after seeing what I saw, part of me knows they're real. Folks in the Boundary Waters whisper about the Wendigo, a ravenous spirit from the old legends. Whatever it was, I know this. I never want to lay eyes on it again. July 9, 1991 Always wanted a piece of land to call my own. Got tired of the rat race, being just another cog in the machine. After getting out of the army, I found a secluded plot in the vast Montana wilderness, built myself a cabin, figured I could finally live life on my terms. Name's Walker. First few years were a simple kind of paradise. Hunted, fished, chopped wood, felt a peace I'd never known in the city. Then folks started going missing. A hiker who strayed off trail, a couple of hunters who never came back to their truck. Some whispered about grizzlies, others blamed packs of wolves getting aggressive. Me, I wasn't so sure. There was something off about those disappearances, a wrongness that prickled the hair on the back of my neck. Then I found Harper. He had a cabin a few miles over, grizzled old mountain man type, kept mostly to himself. Found his place ransacked, blood smeared all over the walls and half-eaten, remains scattered around the clearing. Whatever did that wasn't any animal I recognized. Harper was tough as nails, knew how to handle himself in those woods. Yet something tore him to pieces. That's when the fear set in. I fortified my cabin, reinforced the doors and windows, kept my rifle loaded at all times. Nights were the worst. The woods seemed to hold their breath, a thick silence settling over everything. I'd swear I heard footsteps circling the cabin, the guttural rasp of breathing, the scratch of claws against the walls. Couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched, hunted. Caught a glimpse of it a few weeks later, while out scouting for deer. It was hunched near the creek, a hulking form silhouetted against the twilight. Stood upright on two legs, easily eight feet tall, covered in dark, matted fur. Its face. 
God, that face was stretched and twisted into a parody of a wolf, its mouth full of long, jagged teeth. But those eyes, they burned with a chilling, hungry intelligence. I stumbled back, dropping my pack, terror sending my heart pounding against my ribs. I heard it rise to its full height behind me, a snarl echoing through the dense trees. I didn't stop running until I reached my cabin, collapsing inside and slamming the door shut. Four days it besieged me. Pounded on the walls, tore at my roof, its ragged breathing a constant, maddening torment. I barely ate, jumping at every shadow, the image of Harper's remains and the creature's blazing eyes seared into my mind. I started talking to myself, trying to drown out the scratching and guttural snarls that seemed to come from all sides. One morning, the sounds simply stopped. I waited for hours, a loaded rifle clutched in my trembling hands, but nothing came. Cautiously, I crept outside. The ground around the cabin was trampled and gouged, and a sickening, rotten stench hung heavy in the air. The creature was gone, but the terror remained. I knew it would be back. I couldn't stay. Threw what I could carry into my truck and drove. Didn't stop until I hit the sprawling outskirts of some faceless city. Found a cramped, grimy apartment where the lights never go out and the hum of traffic masked the silence that used to fill me with dread. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I think I still hear the rasp of its breath on the other side of the thin wall. I imagine its burning eyes fixed on my window, smell that rotting musk taint the city air. I sleep with a hunting knife under my pillow and jump at every creek in the old building. Montana, the woods, that simple life I yearn for— all seem like a distant dream now, tainted with the memory of those glowing eyes and Harper's gruesome end. Folks in those parts have stories, whispers of a creature called the Wendigo, a ravenous spirit from the old legends. I don't know what to believe anymore. Only that out there, in the vast, untamed wild, something inhuman walks the lonely places. And some of us, fools that we are, stumble into its path. June 6, 2009 I was tired of playing society's games, tired of the constant hustle, just to earn enough to pay rent and bills. Ex-military, and the quiet life had started to call to me. Found myself a plot of land nestled in the remote Appalachian Mountains, built a small cabin to call my own. Names Everett. First couple of years were bliss. Learned to live off the land, hunted deer, grew my own vegetables, chopped firewood to ward off the winter chill. The woods, they felt safe then, welcoming. Then people from the nearest town started going missing. A couple of drunken teenagers got lost and never turned up. Then old man Carmichael vanished while out checking his hunting traps. Search parties combed the woods but came back empty-handed. Folks whispered about wild hogs getting bold, or moonshiners getting protective of their stills. Me, I had an uneasy feeling, a sense that something unnatural was lurking out there, watching. Then I found Thompson's place. Thompson was another off-gridder, lived a good five-mile hike from my cabin. We weren't close, but we'd swap supplies occasionally share stories over a bottle of whiskey on cold nights. His cabin had been torn apart, like something huge and angry had ripped through it. Blood was splattered all over, and there were pieces of him strewn across the clearing. The sight turned my stomach. This was no bear attack, no wild animal gone rogue. I stumbled back to my cabin in a daze, the brutal image of the aftermath burned into my memory. Secured my doors, loaded my shotgun, and settled in for a sleepless night, 
the silence of the woods broken only by my own ragged breathing. It didn't come for me then, but I knew, deep down, that it was just a matter of time. Every snap of a twig sent me scrambling for my rifle. I slept in short bursts, nightmares of gleaming eyes and ragged snarls jarring me awake. Then one night I saw it. Full moon painted the landscape in an eerie glow, and there it was, hunkered by the tree lean. It stood impossibly tall, eight feet at least, covered in coarse, dark fur. Its head was like a wolf's, only elongated, its muzzle twisted into a grotesque snarl that exposed rows of dagger-like teeth. Those eyes, they were the worst part, burning with yellow light and a chilling malevolence. We locked eyes, and I swear I felt the hunger radiating off it. I fired off a shot, but my trembling hands missed their mark. The creature snarled, a bone-rattling sound that cut through the night, and bolted off into the woods. From then on, the siege began. Every night it circled my cabin, scratching at the walls, leaving deep gouges in the wood. I became a prisoner in my own home, the relentless, guttural snarls and the stink of it, a mix of rotten flesh and something fouler, my constant companions. The psychological torture was almost worse than the threat of physical attack. One morning, it simply wasn't there anymore. No noises, no stench, only the chilling silence of the woods. I waited for days, terror churning in my gut, but it never came back. I took that as my cue to leave. Didn't pack much, just started walking, driven by a blind need to put as much distance between me and those woods as possible. Ended up in a grimy little town, took a job in construction, anything to keep me surrounded by noise and concrete, signs of civilization. Crowds make me uneasy now, bring back the feeling of being watched, hunted. I rent a tiny, nondescript apartment where the walls feel too close, and the windows rattle in the wind. But it's better than the vast, empty silence of the woods. Sometimes, when the breeze carries a musky, rotten scent, I freeze, the image of those blazing yellow eyes flashing in my mind. I hear the crunch of its footsteps in every creak of the old building, taste that primal fear all over again. Maybe it'll track me down, even here. Maybe nowhere is far enough. Folks in the town whisper about the goat man, some kind of cryptid. I wonder if that's what I saw, or if it's something else, something even the old legends haven't given a name. The not knowing might just be the most terrifying part of all. October 23rd, 2012 Always been the self-sufficient type, figured society had too many rules, too many ways to get a man caught up in its rat race. Found myself a plot of land up in Alaska, far off the grid, far from anybody's prying eyes. Built a cabin, learned how to live. Name's Riker. Alaska was paradise at first. Fished, hunted, spent my days surrounded by the raw beauty of the last frontier. Then folks started disappearing. A trapper, some tourists on an extended hike. All vanished without a trace. Rangers combed the area, didn't find much besides some half-eaten animal remains, bigger than any bear I'd seen. Rumors started swirling, folks whispering about strange footprints, unexplained howls in the night. I tried to ignore it, figure they were just stories. Then it came for Jed. Jed had a cabin tucked deep in the woods mile or so north of my spot. Old-timer, mostly kept to himself, knew more about surviving out there than anyone. Found his place. Well, it was more like someone had exploded it from the inside out. Blood everywhere, chunks of. It was hard to tell what had been Jed and what had been whatever tore him to shreds. 
the smell. God, it wasn't something natural. Rotting meat, maybe, mixed with something fouler, almost chemical. That's when the dread settled in my gut. Took precautions, fortified my cabin, made sure my rifle was loaded, slept with one eye open. Nights were the worst. Alaska gets awfully dark in winter, and the silence wasn't that peaceful kind anymore. Every rustle of leaves, every crack of a branch, was it, circling, closing in. Finally, one night under a half moon, I saw it. Hunkered in the shadows at the tree lean, it was easily nine feet tall when it stood upright. Covered in thick, dark fur with patches of mange, its head seemed too big for its body, elongated, with a muzzle like a wolf stretched out long. Worst of all were the eyes. Even in shadow, they glowed with a pale green light, filled with a chilling hunger. We stared at each other, me desperately gripping my rifle, it seemingly sizing me up. Then, without warning, it let out a shriek that seemed to split the night in two, somewhere between a wolf's howl and a rusted hinge. It lunged towards me, moving with impossible speed, and I fired. Heard a roar of pain as the bullets hit their mark. For one terrifying moment, I thought that would be the end of it. But then the creature scrambled back into the trees, disappearing into the darkness. Spent the rest of the night clutching my rifle, listening to its ragged breathing and anguished howls echoing through the woods. By morning, the sounds were gone, but the snow was crisscrossed with tracks bigger than my two hands and the rotten, chemical stench hung heavy in the air. Knew right then I wasn't safe anymore. Sold the cabin for a pittance, barely took time to pack, just started driving south. Didn't stop until I hit the lower forty-eight, ended up in some crowded, nameless city where the noise never ends. Can't stand the smell of car exhaust, makes me think of that other smell the one that clings to the back of my throat even now. Sleep doesn't come easy. My apartment has blackout curtains on every window, and the deadbolt on the door feels flimsy against the memory of the way my cabin shuddered that night. Sometimes, late at night when a siren wails in the distance, I close my eyes and see those glowing orbs in the darkness. I feel that a natural gaze on me, smell that rank, rotten scent. I wonder if it knows I'm here, if it followed my trail, if it's only a matter of time before it finds me amongst the maze of concrete and steel. Folks up north have a name for it, the Neglosii. Skinwalker, they say, but I think it's something older, something less human than those stories let on. It's out there, stalking the forgotten corners of the world, hungering for something it ain't meant to find. And somehow, it found me. May 11, 2006 Figured getting out of the military would mean freedom, peace. Instead, swapped one battlefield for another. City life was choking me, the crowds, the noise the constant feeling of being watched. Found a plot of land tucked away in the backwoods of Oregon, built myself a cabin, figured I could disappear for a while. Call me Bryson. First summer was good. Learned to live off the land, hunted, fished, filled my days with the kind of quiet I hadn't known existed since the sandbox. Then the old logging road that ran near my property started attracting the wrong crowd. Teenagers looking for a place to party, meth heads looking to cook in peace, all leaving their trash and their trouble behind. Drove most of them off with a few warning shots, but one group decided a lone guy in the woods made an easy target. Three of them, rough-looking types, rolled up in a beat-up truck one night. Figured they were looking to steal supplies, maybe rough me up a bit for trying to run them off. I was wrong. They kicked my door down, yelling and spitting threats. 
saw a flash of steel as the biggest one charged me, swinging a length of rusty pipe. Didn't have time to grab my rifle. We crashed into the table, splintering it. I grappled for the pipe, but one of the others kicked me in the ribs, and my grip slipped. The world exploded in pain. When I came to, my hands were bound with duct tape, and they were dragging me towards the back of the cabin. Heard them laughing, talking about the river, about how nobody would find my body. Somehow, fueled by desperation, I twisted free and sprinted towards the tree lean. Gunshots rang out behind me, but the undergrowth was thick, providing some cover. Stumbled through the woods, heart pounding a frantic tattoo, pain radiating through my broken ribs. Didn't know where I was going, just knew I had to get away. And then I saw it. A clearing up ahead, and a hulking shape hunched by the water's edge. At first, in the murky twilight, I thought it was a bear. Then it stood to its full height, a good seven feet tall, and possibly thin. It was like a walking corpse, its skin stretched tight over bone, sickly gray in the gathering gloom. Its arms seemed too long, ending in wicked claws, and its head, that elongated, wolf-like skull twisted towards me, empty eye sockets boring into my hiding spot. The thing let out a shriek that pierced the night, and those other guys, the ones who were chasing me, their voices suddenly went silent. I took my chance, slipped away deeper into the woods, ran until I thought my lungs would burst. Found my way back to what was left of my cabin as dawn painted the sky. The men I fought with were gone, their truck too. There were blood smears on the ground, unnatural-looking tracks clawing through the mud, and a lingering stench that made me wretch. Never called the cops. Couldn't explain the tracks, the smell. Figured they could chalk me up as another victim of the meth trade, some user who'd wandered off and never came back. Sold that patch of land for next to nothing. Figured city crowds and traffic were safer than the isolated silence of the woods. Got myself a tiny apartment, barred the windows, kept a shotgun by the bed. Never found that kind of peace I was seeking again. Some nights, when the fog hangs heavy and a chill creeps into my dingy apartment, I swear I smell that stench again, rotting meat and something sulfurous underneath. Hear the echo of its shriek, feel its empty gaze on my back. Folks whisper stories in those parts, about something lurking in the deep backwoods, something the old-timers used to call a wendigo. They say it craves human flesh, hunts those who trespass on its territory. Whatever it was, I stumbled into its hunting ground that day, and it marked me. Sometimes I think it's waiting for me. That maybe, out there under the endless canopy of trees, it hasn't forgotten. September 4th, 1997. Always been kind of a loner. Got tired of the rat race, the way folks never look you in the eye in the city. Got myself a little plot in the Appalachian Mountains, built myself a cabin, figured I'd live out my days surrounded by nothing but trees and quiet. Names Everett. First few years, it was paradise. Learned to live off the land, hunt, fish, provide for myself. Then things started getting strange. Started with small stuff, tools going missing, misplaced traps. Blamed myself at first, figured I was getting forgetful in my old age. Then it got worse. Waking up one morning, found my woodpile completely gutted, not a single log left. Then there were the sounds, scratching at the walls at night, those guttural growls that shook the whole cabin. It was getting harder to pretend I was alone out there. Then Harper went missing. Lived a few miles further into the woods, another off-the-grid type like myself. 
stopped by his place one day to trade supplies, found it ransacked. Looked like something big and angry had torn through it, leaving blood splatters across the floor. Never found a body, but everyone in these parts knew we weren't dealing with any normal predator. That's when the fear took over. Started carrying a shotgun every time I stepped outside the cabin doors. Slept in shifts, barricaded myself in every night. The worst were the eyes. Twice, I caught glimpses of them gleaming in the darkness at the edge of the tree lean, a burning yellow, filled with a chilling hunger. The thing was circling me, toying with its prey. One moonless night, I saw it in its entirety for the first time. It was hunkered by the stream, easily eight feet tall when it reared up to its full height, covered in coarse, filthy fur. Its limbs were too long, its body almost skeletal, and the head looked like a wolf's skull stretched and twisted into a monstrous caricature, full of needle-sharp teeth. I fumbled for my shotgun, hand trembling, and fired a desperate shot into the darkness. The creature let out an unholy roar, a mix of fury and pain, and bolted into the trees. I spent the rest of that night cowering in a corner, sure every rustle of leaves meant it was coming for me. At first light, I packed the essentials. Didn't take more than a few minutes to abandon the life I'd built. Trucks sputtered and groaned the whole drive into town, but it didn't break down until I reached the outskirts like it knew I was safe. Never went back. Tried to tell the sheriff what I saw, but he just gave me that pitying look they reserve for old drunks and crazy people. Now I'm holed up in a cheap motel room just off the highway. Sounds of traffic keep me up most nights, but it's a fair trade compared to that silence. Every time a dog barks or a siren wails in the distance, my heart leaps into my throat. Can't shake the feeling those yellow eyes are still watching me, waiting for the moment I drop my guard. I spend my days wandering the crowded, grimy streets, face masked to hide my terror, flinching at shadows. I see it sometimes, that hulking shape skulking in alleyways, hunched behind dumpsters, disappearing the moment I blink. The city's no paradise but at least the monsters here have human faces. My money's running low, and I'll be forced to move on soon. Don't know where I'll go, or what I'll do, but every day brings me closer to ending up sleeping under some bridge, my shotgun clutched tight against impossible horrors lurking in the darkness. Folks in these parts have stories, whispers in hushed voices, about something they call the goat man a creature out of old legends. Maybe that's what I saw, maybe it's something far worse. The name hardly matters. All I know is it's out there, stalking the forgotten corners of woods and highways alike, and the only place the light doesn't touch. No matter where I go, it's getting closer. July 9th, 2002 Always figured I wasn't meant for city life. All that noise and shoving and pretending to smile at folks you never want to see again. Got tired of the rat race, being a tiny cog in a machine I didn't understand. Found a sweet deal on a remote chunk of land in the Ozarks. Trees, solitude, and a ramshackle cabin to call my own. Name's Walker. Figured I'd live out my days there, fish, hunt, grow a beard down to my belly button. Paradise it was for a good long while. Then the whispers started in town, folks going missing, hikers vanishing on the trails, hunters found torn to ribbons with half-eaten remains. Never saw anything myself, passed it off as wild hog attacks, meth heads making bad decisions. I had my own land, my own peace. Figured I was safe. Then old man Jessup went missing. Lived a couple of miles up the dirt road, 
stubborn old goat, kept mostly to himself. Didn't think much of it until I found his dog wandering near my place, half-starved and skittish. Figured I'd best go check on him. I wish I hadn't. Jessup's cabin was wrecked. Door smashed in, furniture overturned, blood and other bits scattered all over. Wasn't animal tracks leading away from the place, but something bigger, heavier. Whatever did it wasn't worried about leaving a trail, wasn't worried about being followed. The dread settled deep in my gut then. I wasn't alone out there anymore. I started sleeping with my shotgun loaded, bolted the doors, jumped at every night's sound. Found myself staring into the darkness, seeing movement at the edge of the tree lean, hearing those ragged, hungry breaths on the other side of my flimsy wooden walls. Then, one night, I saw it. Full moon painted the ridge in an eerie silver light, and it stepped out from the trees. Must have been nine feet tall, covered in matted fur. Its body looked too thin, almost skeletal, and that head, like a wolf's, only stretched, twisted all wrong. Its teeth looked as long as my fingers, and its eyes, even in the shadows, burned a sickly yellow. I fumbled for the shotgun, but the creature let out a roar that shook the whole cabin. It charged, and I fired at what I thought was its chest. The blast knocked it back, and it shrieked in pain before scrambling over the ridge, disappearing into the trees. I spent the rest of the night waiting for the attack that never came, clutching the shotgun like a lifeline, the stench of it, rotting meat and something sulfurous underneath, lingering in the night air. Come dawn, I didn't hesitate. I packed a few things into my truck, left that piece of paradise without a backward glance. Never felt so relieved as when I finally hit the interstate left the backwoods behind for the noise and the crowds. Took me months to stop flinching every time a car backfired, to stop seeing those yellow eyes in my nightmares. Got myself a little apartment in the city, windows facing away from any patch of woods. I keep the blinds closed, double-check the locks on the flimsy door. Still get spooked when a dog barks down the hall, and sometimes... I think I catch a whiff of that rotten, chemical smell in the stuffy hallway air. Folks up in the Ozarks, they got stories of a creature they call the Howler. Never believed in such tales, never figured I'd become part of one myself. Whatever that thing was, I wounded it, maybe drove it off for a while. But I got a feeling, deep down, that it hasn't forgotten about me. I got a feeling that, out there in the endless stretch of woods under the endless stretch of sky, it's getting stronger, healing up, biding its time. One day, those yellow eyes are gonna come looking for me again. And next time, I doubt I'll get so lucky. This happened to me on July 22, 1997. A Tuesday. My name's Caleb, and I've lived out here in the Olympic National Forest for eight years now. Wasn't always this way. Used to work construction. Had a wife. The whole nine yards. But this, this is living. Don't get me wrong, it's work. But it's my work. Peaceful. Well, usually peaceful. The days bleed together sometimes, what with the routine. Up at dawn, check the traps, tend the garden, chop wood. It's a good system, keeps me busy, keeps me fed. This morning, I was heading back to the cabin when I saw it. Thought it was a deer carcass at first, all sprawled out weird in the clearing. Figured maybe a cougar got to it. But then I got closer, and the smell... God, the smell hit me. Not right. Not like anything I'd come across out here. Closer still, and I realized it wasn't a deer. It was Jenkins. Old Ben Jenkins, the hermit that lived a few miles east. 
Now, I wasn't what you'd call friends with Ben. Grumpy old coot kept to himself. Still, I'd seen him in town once or twice, traded supplies. So, finding him like that, well, it rattled me. He was torn up bad. No fur, not like a predator got him. Skin was peeled in places. And his eyes, wide open, staring at nothing. Never seen a man look so terrified. Took every ounce of willpower not to turn tail and run. Figured I owed it to him. Figure out who or what did this. I called out, no answer. Hunted around the clearing, looking for something, anything out of place. Found some tracks. They were big, too big for a bear or anything normal out here. And the shape, wrong. Didn't have claws, more like fingers, only longer. I followed those tracks into the woods, my rifle gripped tight. My heart was pounding, sweat rolling down my face. I knew I wasn't tracking a deer anymore. The trail zigzagged, like it was searching for something. I pressed forward, a knot in my stomach. The air grew heavy, like before a storm. Birdsong had gone silent. The hairs stood up on my neck. I was being watched. The tracks led me to a creek. There I saw more, what Ben had become. Bits and pieces strewn about like some monstrous child had gotten bored with a toy. Almost lost my lunch right then and there. A branch snapped behind me. I spun around, rifle raised. Nothing but the dense trees. Panic surged through me. I backed away slowly, eyes darting between the shadows. That's when I saw it. Crouched on a massive boulder was the biggest, ugliest thing I'd ever laid eyes on. Tall as a man, maybe taller, with skin like raw, mottled leather. Its head was too big, jaw hanging slack, a tangle of teeth like broken glass. Its eyes, Lord, those eyes, yellow and slitted like a snake's, focused right on me. It let out a low growl that made the ground tremble. I fired a warning shot, but it didn't flinch. We stared at each other, time itself frozen. Then it lunged. I broke and ran. I didn't stop running until I fell into my cabin and bolted the door. Never went back to that clearing. Hell, I don't go deep into the woods anymore. Whatever that thing was, it owns that territory now. I hear it at night sometimes, a guttural howl that sends chills down my spine. Some folks in town think I went mad, seeing Ben like that. Maybe they're right. But I know what I saw. They call it Bigfoot and other fancy names. Me. I just call it the Ripper. Word of Ben's death spread through town like wildfire. The sheriff chalked it up to a bear attack, but folks whispered otherwise. They looked at me, the crazy hermit, the only one who'd seen the scene. They asked questions I couldn't answer, not without sounding even crazier. Summer turned to fall, and the woods blazed with color. I tried to stick to my routine— tried to pretend that thing wasn't out there. But the fear gnawed at me. Every rustle of leaves was a predator on the prowl. I started sleeping with a shotgun instead of a pillow. Then came the noises. Scraping outside the cabin at night. Howls closer than before, circling in the darkness. They were toying with me, I knew it. Each dawn I'd step outside, shotgun in hand, and find tracks circling my home. The breaking point came on a crisp November morning. My traps were empty again, but not sprung. They'd been raided, the food gone, and fresh tracks led away into the trees. This wasn't just hunting, this was intelligent. It wanted to starve me out. That's when I made the plan. Dangerous, reckless, but it was the only thing I could think of. I'd packed what I could carry, doused the cabin in kerosene, 
and waited until nightfall. The moon hung heavy in the sky, casting long, twisted shadows. I set fire to my home. Flames shot into the night, illuminating the clearing. And there it was. The ripper, silhouetted against the fire, its eyes gleaming like hot coals. It roared, a sound of fury and frustration. That was my cue. I ran. Not away from it, but deeper into the woods, following a trail I'd memorized. My plan was simple, lead it towards town. If the creature was what I thought it was, it craved isolation. The lights, the noise, the multitude of people, it would be driven back. I ran for my life, branches tearing at my clothes, my lungs burning. The ripper's howls echoed behind me, getting closer. I stumbled, fell, scrambled to my feet just as it burst through a thicket. Moonlight gleamed off its teeth as it lunged. I rolled, feeling its monstrous hand rip through my jacket. My shotgun was lost, but I still had my knife. A desperate gamble. I gripped the blade and turned in one movement, slashing out as the ripper hurtled past. A scream, not mine, ripped through the night. I hit something, felt warm liquid splatter across my face. Then the ripper was gone, vanished back into the shadows. I lay there, panting, heart pounding against my ribs. Then, slowly, I pushed myself up. Had it worked? Had I actually hurt the thing? The stench of blood hung heavy in the air, an acrid, unfamiliar smell. I fumbled for my flashlight, flicking it on. The beam cut through the darkness, revealing a crimson trail leading further into the trees. The thing was injured but alive. My gamble had failed. With a heavy heart, I turned and stumbled towards the lights of town. There would be questions, accusations, more disbelief. But that was the least of my worries now. The aftermath? Let's just say the sleepy town nestled in the shadow of Olympic National Forest hasn't been so sleepy since. There have been more disappearances, more gruesome remains found on the fringes of the woods. They blame it on bears, cougars, even drug cartels using the remote wilderness. Only I know the truth. That creature, the Ripper, it's still out there. Wounded, angry, and likely biding its time. I live in a cheap motel room now, always looking over my shoulder. They think I'm the crazy one, but I'm still alive. Can't say the same for the folks who stayed behind. Some nights, I hear those howls carried on the wind, and I know it hasn't forgotten me. September 1st, 1998 Still can't shake the image of that thing sniffing outside my window. Had to act. Grabbed a few essential supplies, food, water, flashlight, knife, some matches, and shoved them into my old rucksack. Made sure the rifle was loaded and checked the ammo in my pocket. Couldn't go out the way I came in. The creature was probably still watching. The back window of the cabin faced the lake. Had an idea, a desperate one, but maybe my only shot took a deep breath and flung open the window, vaulted out and hit the ground running, heart pounding in my ears, heard a low growl behind me and didn't look back, sprinted across the clearing to the shoreline, nearly tripping over tangled roots. My canoe was still tied up, just a dark shape against the water, jumped in and pushed off hard, paddled furiously, muscles straining, Behind me, I heard a splash and a furious snarl. The creature was coming after me. Glanced back, nearly losing my balance. It was swimming. Swiftly. Each power stroke with its massive paws propelled it closer. Its long snout cut through the water, T 
teeth bared in silent fury. The size of it. Never would have believed something that big could move so damn fast on land and water. It looked wrong, almost unnatural. And those eyes glowed yellow in the half-light, filled with nothing but predatory hunger. Ahead of me, the shoreline of a small island appeared in the mist. My only chance. Paddled like a madman, arms burning. The canoe hit land with a jolt, and I scrambled out, dragging it into the bushes. Didn't bother to hide it. Just ran. Ran for my life, deeper into the thick tangle of pines. Tripped over exposed roots, branches whipping my face. I could hear the creature behind me, crashing through the undergrowth, those horrible, growling snarls getting closer. Found a fallen log, thick and gnarled. Dove behind it, catching my breath. Moonlight filtered through the leaves, casting long, dancing shadows that made my stomach clench. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, had me tensing, ready to run. It stalked past the log. I watched with sickening fascination as it moved, low to the ground. The flat head, long neck, and powerful shoulders, it reminded me of those reconstructed dinosaur skeletons in museums. But this thing was all too real, its muscles rippling under slick, scaly skin. The tail was thick and long, almost reptilian, whipping back and forth, it stopped suddenly, head snapping up. I held my breath. Had it smelled me? Nosed at the ground, then moved on, disappearing back into the trees. I waited an eternity, then crawled out of my hiding spot. Legs felt like jelly. Where could I go? Nowhere on this island was safe. Then I remembered. Years ago, exploring these islands... I'd stumbled across a small, partially collapsed cave. It was on the far side, maybe a half-mile hike, but it was a place to hide. I sprinted through the trees, guided by memory and blind desperation. Finally, it came into view, a dark gash in the rocky outcrop, overgrown with thick vines and brush. Dropped to my knees and crawled inside. It was tight, the damp air heavy with the smell of earth. Scooted in as far as I could, pulled some branches in over the entrance to mask myself. And I waited. Listened to the sounds of the forest. Distant chirping of crickets, the occasional hoot of an owl. But above it all, my own ragged breathing. The days blurred together in a desperate cycle of hiding and running. I survived on rainwater and wild berries, every rustle in the trees setting my heart pounding. The creature stalked me relentlessly. I'd see a flash of its hulking form through the trees or find massive, clawed footprints in the mud. Sometimes, I'd wake to its guttural snarls echoing through the night. Sleep became a dangerous luxury, exhaustion my worst enemy. My clothes hung in tatters. I was gaunt, filthy, barely human anymore. But the creature hadn't given up, and neither could I. Driven by fear and instinct, I moved deeper into the wilderness. I found a makeshift shelter in an abandoned trapper's shack, rotting wood and musty blankets, but still better than the open woods. The creature found me there, of course. I heard the splintering of wood and frantic scrabbling managed to barricade the door just before it charged. It circled the shack, snarling and ramming the walls until the whole structure shook. Then, abruptly, it fell silent. I huddled in a corner, shaking, the rifle clutched tight. Hours passed. Finally, as dawn began to filter through the trees, I risked a peek outside. The creature was gone, but the destruction it left behind chilled me to the bone, half the wall torn down and debris scattered everywhere. I wouldn't be safe here for long. That day, I made a grim decision. I could run forever, 
but sooner or later the exhaustion or the creature would get me. Instead, I had a different plan. Desperate, dangerous, but maybe my only chance. I spent hours scavenging anything useful from the ruined shack. Old nails, a broken fishing spear, some frayed twine. Rigged a crude trap near the doorway, using my weight to counterbalance a massive log propped precariously against a tree. The creature was smart, but hunger was a powerful motivator. I just had to hope it was hungry enough. As darkness fell, I positioned myself in a thick stand of trees overlooking the shack. The wait was excruciating. Every owl hoot and rustle of the wind had me tensing, rifle at the ready. It came as a hulking shadow slinking out of the forest. I watched, heart pounding, as it circled the shack, sniffing the air. Then it moved towards the doorway, stepping right where I needed it. I hurled the rock towards the opposite side of the shack, making as much noise as I could. The creature flinched, head snapping up in the direction of the sound. And in that instant I cut the rope. The log came crashing down. I didn't wait to see if my trap had worked. I ran. Through the night, fueled by adrenaline and desperation, I stumbled through the wilderness. As the sun rose, I found myself at the edge of a wide river. For a moment, hope sparked. If I could swim across, maybe I could put enough distance between myself and the island. But then I saw them the bodies strewn along the river bank. A group of campers, their colorful tents reduced to shredded fabric. Blood smeared the rocks. It was carnage, the creature's handiwork on gruesome display. Despair washed over me. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. I collapsed on the ground, shaking with sobs. I was trapped. And the creature knew exactly where I was. And that's when I heard it, the plodding, heavy footsteps coming closer. My breath hitched. I fumbled for my rifle, but my fingers felt numb. The footsteps stopped just on the other side of a thick stand of trees. It was close, too close. Then silence. Just the pounding of my heart in my ears. Had it lost interest? Had it moved on? I slowly rose to my feet, rifle clutched tight. No matter what, I'd go down fighting. As I crept toward the edge of the trees, I thought about Duke, my loyal dog waiting back home, wondering if I'd ever return. A wave of exhaustion washed over me, mingled with a strange sense of calm. I stepped out from behind the trees and froze. The creature stood on the river bank, its back to me. The rising sun caught on its slick scales, highlighting the massive, rippling muscles. Slowly it lowered its flat head and began to drink from the water. I raised the rifle, took aim. My finger hovered over the trigger. One shot and maybe, just maybe. But I couldn't do it. The creature wasn't evil, not like how we understand it. It was a force of nature, a predator at the top of its food chain. In a strange way, I couldn't even blame it for the destruction it left behind. This was its territory. I was the one who didn't belong. I lowered the rifle. The creature lifted its head, sensing something had changed. It turned, and for a long moment, we simply stared at each other. In those bloodshot yellow eyes, I saw hunger, rage, and a primal sort of cunning. But not hatred, not for me. Then it turned and padded into the trees, disappearing back into its domain. The rescue party found me sitting by the river two days later. I was babbling incoherently, my clothes in tatters, hair wild and matted. They airlifted me to a hospital. Severe malnutrition, dehydration, and exposure, the doctors said. And the psychological trauma that would take far longer to heal, if it ever did. 
My tale of the creature in the boundary waters was dismissed as ravings brought on by my ordeal. Of course, there were a few whispers, theories floated about a mutated bear or an escaped exotic animal. But official reports concluded it was a tragic series of animal attacks, a stark reminder of the wilderness's brutality. I never went back to the boundary waters, and never wanted to. Sold my cabin as is, leaving everything behind. Donated the proceeds to wildlife conservation efforts, a small, symbolic gesture against the force that nearly destroyed me. Got an apartment in the city, surrounded by concrete and noise, as far from the wild solitude as I could get. But even now, years later, I can still hear the creature sometimes, its heavy footsteps, its guttural snarls echoing through my nightmares. I see the yellow eyes burning in the darkness. And I know, it's out there, still roaming its territory. The hunter, forever unbound. July 20th, 2012 Spent the last few years hopping around, never staying in one place too long. Finally found a spot that feels remote enough, an old, abandoned fire lookout tower in the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness. Hell of a climb up here, but worth it for the solitude. Figure nobody will bother me for miles. My name's Alex. Ex-military, went into survival training for a couple of years after my discharge. Guess I never shook the itch for roughing it. Cities make me anxious, all the people and noise. Out here it's quiet, peaceful. Spent the first few days fixing up the tower. Rusty old thing, but the structure is solid. Got a good supply of canned food, rainwater collection system, solar panel for basic necessities. I'm set for a couple of months, at least. The views up here are incredible. Miles of rolling forest, cut through with rivers and canyons. Breathtaking stuff. I spend hours just watching, binoculars in hand, looking for anything that moves. Old habit, I guess. Been here a week now. Routine is kicking in chop firewood, Check supplies, scan the tree line. Keeps me busy, keeps my mind off, well, off everything else. Got a decent internet connection, though. Sometimes, late at night, I browse news sites, missing person reports, the usual morbid stuff I try to avoid. Keeps reminding me why I live like this. Found something strange yesterday while scanning the woods. Near the canyon... There was a splash of color that didn't belong, bright orange, torn and tattered. Looked like the remains of a tent. Campers probably got careless, I figured. This morning, decided to check it out. Just in case someone needed help. Geared up, loaded the rifle, and started the long trek down the mountain. Took a good few hours to reach the spot. Found the campsite or what was left of it. It was wrong. The tent wasn't just torn, it was shredded. Fabric ripped in long gashes, the metal poles bent and twisted. Food containers were scattered everywhere, their contents smashed and half-eaten. And there was blood. Spatters of it across the rocks, smeared into the dirt. Whatever had done this was big, powerful, and messy. My instinct screamed at me to turn back, but there was a trail, easy to spot in the damp undergrowth. Not footprints, but something dragging, marking the ground. I followed, rifle ready, heart pounding against my ribs. The trail led deeper into the woods and ended at a cave, a yawning black hole in the hillside. The smell hit me first, coppery and rank, the scent of old blood. My stomach clenched, but some part of me, some stupid, reckless part, felt compelled to keep going. With a shaking hand, 
I switched on my flashlight and stepped into the darkness. The beam sliced through the gloom, revealing a horrifying sight. Bones were scattered on the cave floor, some old and some bleached, likely deer or other wildlife, mixed in with newer remains, human remains. A gnawed skull stared blankly at me, shards of a shattered pelvis lay near my feet. Heard a noise behind me, a wet, snuffling sound. Spun around, the flashlight beam catching on two glowing eyes deep in the darkness. They were low to the ground, reflecting the light with a predatory yellow gleam. My blood ran cold. It was huge, far bigger than any wolf or bear I'd ever seen, its hulking form shifting in the shadows. The creature let out a low growl, the sound reverberating through the cave. I didn't wait for another invitation. Turned and ran. Stumbled and fell, flashlights skittering across the rocks as I scrambled to my feet. The creature roared behind me, the sound deafening, echoing off the cave walls. Blindly, I bolted back into the forest. It stalked me. For hours, it felt like. Every time I thought I'd lost it, I'd hear a snap of a branch, catch a glimpse of those glowing eyes between the trees. It was toying with me, keeping me running. Terror lent me an unnatural burst of speed, but exhaustion gnawed at me. I tripped, stumbled, my lungs screaming for air. Finally I saw it, the fire tower looming in the distance. A desperate surge of hope ignited in me. Nearly there, nearly safe. I broke out of the tree line, sprinted across the clearing towards the base of the tower. Behind me, the creature roared in frustration, its footsteps like thunder. I started scrambling up the metal ladder. The rungs were cold beneath my numb hands, tears of exhaustion streaming down my face. Just when I thought my muscles would give out, I hauled myself onto the platform at the top. Below, the creature circled the base of the tower, snarling, its massive claws scrabbling at the metal. I fumbled at my backpack, hands shaking, and pulled out my binoculars. Now, in the fading sunlight, I got a proper look at it. It was reptilian in a way. Scaly hide stretched tight over bulging muscles, its body long and sinuous. The head was massive and flat with a wickedly hooked snout filled with serrated teeth. Its legs were thick and powerful, but the forelimbs were oddly elongated, ending in hooked talons. And the tail, God, the tail was at least as long as its body, thick and muscular. This was no bear, no mutated wolf. This was something else, something out of a nightmare. And it was trapped at the base of my tower. For the time being, I was safe. For the time being. Absolutely. Let's bring Alex's harrowing struggle to a dramatic and tragic conclusion. Days turned into a nightmarish blur. Trapped on my tower, I became the creature's prisoner. It paced below, restless, occasionally lunging at the base of the structure and shaking the whole thing until my teeth rattled. Each night, its guttural growls and furious roars were a constant, horrifying soundtrack. Sleep came in fitful bursts, plagued by dreams where I was the prey, desperately running through the trees as it hunted me with relentless, predatory cunning. I lived on a dwindling supply of rations and rainwater, knowing they wouldn't last forever. My rifle was useless up here. One clear shot was all I had, and the creature was too smart to expose itself like that for long. Despair started gnawing at my resolve. How long could I hold out? Until I starved? Until the creature learned how to climb the damn tower? On the fifth day, I made a desperate decision. I couldn't stay on my tower and wait for death. At least in the forest, even hunted, I had a chance. Slender, but still a chance. Using spare rope and old canvas, 
I crafted a makeshift harness and a crude pulley system. With trembling hands, I loaded my backpack with as much as it would hold, remaining supplies, binoculars, my knife, the first aid kit. I would travel light, travel fast. That night, as the creature paced below, I lowered my pack to the ground. Then, with a last glance down at the waiting predator, I took a deep breath and climbed over the railing. Hand over hand, I descended into the darkness, the rough metal biting into my palms. My heart was a frantic drumbeat against my ribs. My boots hit the ground with a muffled thud. For a terrifying moment, I stood frozen, expecting the creature to charge from the shadows. But it was nowhere to be seen. I didn't waste time. Used my flashlight sparingly, navigating the familiar terrain by the pale glow of the moon. The forest felt more menacing at night, every creaking branch amplifying my terror. Hours blurred together. I moved southeast. The canyon was that way, cut deep into the landscape, a natural barrier the creature might struggle to cross. My only hope was to reach it. As dawn broke, I heard it, the heavy, ground-shaking footsteps behind me. It had picked up my scent. I broke into a dead run, my lungs screaming in protest. Trees blurred on either side, the undergrowth tearing at my exposed skin. I could hear it closing in, its snarls growing louder. Finally, I burst through the trees and onto a high ledge. And there, below me, was the canyon a vast chasm cleaving the earth, the river a steely ribbon far, far down. I was out of options. The creature came through the trees, slowing to a halt as it sawed the drop. It snarled, pacing back and forth, and in its eyes I saw a glimmer of hesitation. Was it afraid? Perhaps even it couldn't cross this vast gulf. But then, it lowered its body, the massive muscles in its legs bunching. It was preparing to jump. My blood chilled. The creature lunged, its body soaring through the air, a monstrous, scaly missile aimed right at me. I flung myself sideways, rolling desperately. I felt a searing pain in my shoulder as the creature landed with a thunderous crash where I'd stood just seconds before its claws slashing deep gouges into the rock. The edge of the cliff crumbled beneath the force, showering us with dirt and pebbles. It snarled, scrambling for purchase, and I saw my chance. Still clutching the binoculars I'd looped around my neck, I bolted towards the trees. The creature roared in fury, renewed determination in its movement. But it was struggling, its bulk hindering it on the narrow cliff. I heard a sickening crack of stone and a shriek of animal rage as it lost its footing, crashing halfway down the cliff face before catching itself on an outcropping of rock. I didn't look back. I ran, heart pounding, lungs burning, towards temporary salvation in the form of the dense forest. Didn't stop until I was deep among the shadows of the trees, collapsing onto the needle-strewn ground with a sob. I wandered lost for days. The creature had stopped following, probably injured in its fall. But in the vast wilderness, I was alone and starving. I found berries, gnawed on wild roots, but it wasn't enough. Weakness gnawed at me, blurred my vision. It was only a matter of time. Then, a miracle— I stumbled across an abandoned logging road, long since overgrown but still discernible. I followed it blindly, not caring where it led, only that it offered direction out of the relentless maze of trees. And that's when they found me, a search and rescue team drawn to the area by reports of a missing hiker. I was delirious, babbling about the creature, unable to convince them of the true horror of what I endured. They airlifted me to a hospital. Severe dehydration, malnutrition, and a badly dislocated shoulder. But the psychological wounds, 
those would take far longer to heal, if they ever did. I never went back to the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness, never returned to the life I had chosen. The doctors called it PTSD, the nightmare is a symptom of my trauma. But I know what I saw, what hunted me through that desolate land. There are places out there, remote and untouched, where the shadows hold things mankind has long forgotten. The creature, whatever it is, is still out there. It roams its territory, a monstrous predator at the very top of its food chain. Sometimes, late at night, I see the flicker of yellow eyes in the darkness beyond my window and hear the low rumble of a hungry growl. And I know, it waits. It remembers. And some day, it might come for me again. This happened to me in September 2008. I was running late that morning. I had a dentist appointment in Bend, a two-hour drive from where I lived. Normally I like to have a hot breakfast before a long drive, but I had to settle for grabbing an energy bar and a bottle of water. I live off the grid. Most folks think that's crazy, but it works for me. I spent over a decade in the military, then another few years bouncing around doing security jobs. It wasn't the life for me long term. The quiet suits me. I have a small solar setup, a solid well, and I grow a lot of my own food. It's a good life. My place is up in the Achoco National Forest in Oregon. Dense evergreen woods, rolling hills, and the occasional creek cutting through. Most of my neighbors are elk and deer, which I don't mind. It's rugged country, to be sure, and not easy to reach. That's the whole point. My truck, an old Tacoma, is built for the rough logging roads. I made it maybe halfway to the highway when I saw a figure up ahead. It looked like a person at first, lanky and hunched over, standing right in the middle of the road. I hit the brakes. I didn't see anyone else around, or a disabled vehicle nearby. As I got closer, something seemed off about the figure. The proportions were wrong. I pulled up about twenty feet away and put the truck in park. It didn't move. Now I've seen all sorts of animals during my time in the woods. Bears, cougars, even a wolverine once. But this, this was something else. It stood on two legs, but its back was hunched over at an unnatural angle. The head seemed too big for its body, like a misshapen bowling ball. I couldn't make out its features from this distance. Its skin looked hairless and gray, stretched tight over its bones. I reached for the rifle I keep next to the seat, more out of habit than anything else. The creature didn't react. It just stood there, unmoving. It gave me the creeps. Suddenly, it snapped its head toward me. I swore that I could see its eyes lock onto mine, even through the windshield. My hand froze on the rifle. I don't believe in Bigfoot or all that nonsense, but I couldn't explain what the hell I was looking at. Then it moved. It charged at the truck. I don't mean in a graceful, animalistic way. It lunged with jerky, uneven steps. It screeched, a horrifying piercing sound that sent a chill straight down my spine. My brain finally kicked back into gear. I threw the Tacoma into reverse and slammed on the gas. I caught a glimpse of the creature in my side mirror. It was gaining on me. Its arms hung long, almost to the ground, with what looked like claws at the end. Panic fueled me then. I swerved back and forth on the dirt road, making myself a harder target. I heard the thud and screech as it bashed into the truck, leaving deep gouges in the metal. My only goal then was to get to the highway. If I was lucky, another vehicle might be passing. 
Maybe the creature would lose interest if there was easier prey. The road twisted through the dense forest, and my heart was in my throat the entire time. I drove like a madman. I could hear the creature screaming behind me, sometimes catching glimpses of it hurtling through the trees alongside me. I finally reached the highway and gunned it toward Bend. I kept checking the rearview mirror, half expecting the creature to burst out of the forest and snatch me off the road. I didn't stop speeding until I saw the first exit signs for town. Once I was among houses and traffic, I pulled into a gas station parking lot and collapsed. I must have sat there shaking for a full hour, trying to catch my breath and convince myself I wasn't losing my mind. I called the ranger's office from the gas station's payphone. They listened to my story without comment, but promised to send someone out to look around. I knew there wouldn't be much they could do. Hell, the creature could be miles from my place by now. I filed a report with the state troopers, too, but it felt equally useless. I didn't drive home that night. I got a cheap motel room and tried to get some sleep. But every time I closed my eyes, I saw that thing charging my truck. A few days later, I got a call from one of the rangers. His voice was tight, and he told me he was sending a couple of deputies to meet me at my property. I didn't ask questions, just told him I'd be on my way. When I pulled off the highway, two patrol cars were waiting for me on the dirt track that wound up to my place. We drove up in a convoy. The forest felt too quiet, and every rustle of leaves made me jump. We reached the clearing around my cabin. Nothing looked disturbed, which was both reassuring and worrying. We did a thorough walk around, the deputies, their guns out, scanning the tree lean, and myself following, gripping my rifle with white knuckles. That's when we found it. Down by the creek bed, a deer carcass lay half-eaten. The meat was not right. It looked torn away in ragged strips, not the clean cuts of a predator. The bones had all been crushed, splintered like broken twigs. One of the deputies bent over and peered closer. I could hear him gag. He pointed to a patch of trampled underbrush next to the body of the deer. We moved closer. It was a footprint. It was shaped roughly like a human foot, but massive, with what looked like four long toes ending in vicious claw marks raking the dirt. The deputies and I looked at each other, but no one spoke. We knew what made that print. They took some photos and collected what little evidence they could. Mostly, their presence was about making me feel a little less alone out here. There have been other signs of the creature over the years. Once, I found more half-devoured carcasses near the creek. Another time, I woke up to those same horrific shrieks echoing through the forest. To this day, I hear strange noises sometimes, just beyond the reach of my campfire light. A lot of folks would call me crazy. They'd say I imagined the whole thing or blamed an unknown animal attack on some monster. But I know what I saw, what I lived through. I still live on that same property. Most days, life is normal. But I'm never complacent. I make sure my rifle's well-oiled, and I keep my floodlights blazing all night. Sometimes I hear something moving in the woods— or catch a whiff of a sickeningly musky smell I know all too well now. See, the worst part isn't what I saw. It's what I suspect. I have the horrifying feeling that whatever that creature is, it's learned. I think it's watching. I think it's waiting. And as isolated as I am, I might just be the perfect prey. The locals give it a name, something they whisper in hushed voices. The Rake This happened back in July 1991. 
I remember because it was right around the 4th of July weekend, and there's always that big fireworks show down at the lake that everyone goes to. See, I live up in the Mount Hood National Forest. Got a nice little spot carved out, maybe ten miles past the last paved road. It wasn't easy to set up, but I liked my peace and quiet. My nearest neighbors are a family of badgers, and we usually stay out of each other's way. My cabin's built tough, got a well for clean water, and enough solar to keep the essentials going. Took a lot of trips back and forth from town at the start, hauling up building supplies and everything, but I got there in the end. Before the woods, I put in a few years with the park service doing backcountry maintenance and fire control. I know that forest like the back of my hand. Or, well, I used to. I'll get to that. My name's Wyatt. Anyway, I decided to stock up on supplies for the holiday weekend since I didn't plan on joining any of the festivities. Made the drive into the nearest town, the usual place where everyone around here gets their provisions. I loaded up my old Ford Ranger with food, firewood, that kind of thing. On the way back, a bit past government camp, I spotted something out on the side of the road. It looked like a garage sale sign, but it was hand-painted on an old chunk of plywood and stuck into the ground in the middle of nowhere. I slowed down to get a closer look. In messy lettering, it read, Free Meat Fresh. There was a crude-looking arrow pointing down a gravel side road. Now, I'm not the sort to take random offers out in the wilderness. But something about seeing that sign on a day I was on my way to buy groceries tickled me funny. Besides, my curiosity had been piqued. I shifted the truck into four-wheel drive and ventured onto that gravel road. It twisted and turned for about a mile, cutting deeper into the woods. The density of the trees made it feel like evening already even though it was the middle of the afternoon. Finally, the road spat me out into a small, cleared-out area. Perched in the center of that clearing was a ramshackle wooden cabin. It wasn't the cute kind of cabin, either. This thing looked like someone had built it out of bits of scrap wood they found washed up on a beach. There was a battered old pickup parked out front, and smoke curled from its chimney. I rolled the window down and took a deep breath. The air smelled wrong, off, musty, with an underlying hint of something rotten. I got that kind of smell sometimes out in the woods with an old animal carcass, but this was stronger. Then a man stepped out from the cabin. He was tall and lean, and moved with a strange, jerky shuffle. His clothes were ragged, the kind of stereotypical backwoods hermit might wear. One thing I noticed right away was that he held a rifle loosely in one hand. Now, a lot of folks keep guns out this way, but something in his posture didn't sit right with me. Howdy! he called out, and his voice was surprisingly sharp and clear, not the gruff mumble I'd expected. Saw your truck coming, figured a good neighbor would stop by. He took a few steps toward me. Something was off with his walk. It was almost like he was limping, but not in a regular way. Now that I was closer, that smell had intensified, almost making me gag. I waved back, trying to sound casual. Just following your sign, I said, nodding toward the road. Thought I could use some of that meat. The man's grin widened showing a mess of chipped and rotted teeth. He gestured toward his cabin. Help yourself, friend. Got more than I could ever eat out back. I looked at the cabin, at the man, his smile, and at that rifle, and knew right then that I had made a terrible mistake. I shifted the truck back into gear. Actually, I started keeping my voice steady. I'm all set for now. Got a load of perishables in the back. Don't want em to spoil. For a moment, his gaze hardened, and he tightened his grip on the rifle. 
But then, his face relaxed back into that unsettling grin. Suit yourself. But if you change your mind, offer still stands. I nodded quickly, threw the truck into reverse and hightailed it back down that gravel road. I could feel his eyes watching me the whole way. As I drove, the stench of rot followed me, stubbornly clinging to my truck's interior. Back on the highway, I pulled over to the shoulder and jumped out. I threw open the tailgate and looked through my supplies, half expecting to see some unknown carcass hidden among them. There was nothing but the usual stuff, thank goodness. I took some extra time checking every nook and cranny of the truck, but I found nothing. Finally convinced I hadn't brought anything back with me, I climbed back in and continued the drive home. I kept checking my rearview mirror until I was deep within the familiar part of the forest. But by the time I reached my turn-off, most of the unease had faded away. I blamed the whole incident on being too long in my own company and swore to myself I'd take a trip down to the town bar for some socializing soon. Things were fine for a couple of weeks. Then the nightmares started. They were vivid and always the same. I'd be out in the woods near my property, doing some chores. From the corner of my eye, I'd catch glimpses of a shape moving between the trees, hulking with long, twisted limbs. Its face, its face was the worst part, sunken with giant, mismatched eyes glaring straight at me. Those eyes always jolted me awake. I'd lie there, heart pounding, and tell myself it was just bad dreams. Stress from living alone, maybe a touch of cabin fever. The logical part of my brain took over after a while, and I drifted back to sleep. One morning I woke up, fixed my coffee, and walked outside to start my day. And something was missing. My dog, Scout. She's a big old mutt, part husky, part I don't know what, but loyal through and through. She's always at the door, wagging her tail to greet me in the mornings. I called and whistled for her, but nothing. Now, she's free to roam the woods around the cabin, has been since she was a pup. It wasn't unusual for her to be off sniffing around for critters, but she'd usually come back when I called, especially this early when her tummy would be rumbling. I decided to walk the perimeter of my property, just to be sure. That's when I found the blood. It started as a few spatters on the ground near the tree lean, then formed a trail leading into the thick undergrowth. I hesitated before pushing into the woods, my instincts screaming at me to be careful. I drew the point three five seven magnum that I kept loaded and ready by the door. I followed the spatters heart sinking with each step. I knew in my gut what I would find. Finally, the trail led to a clearing, and there she lay, my scout. Her body was mangled, barely recognizable. It looked like something had torn her apart with its bare hands. I had to force myself to look away, hot bile rising in my throat. I backed out of the clearing, mind reeling. It seemed impossible that some mountain lion or bear would do this. The wounds were wrong. And why would a predator kill and not drag her off to eat later? I made my way back to the cabin, feeling numb. Those nightmares came back with a vengeance after that. The figure was bolder in my dreams, standing closer to the edge of the woods, peering out at me. I couldn't take it any more. A few days later, I packed enough gear for a few nights and headed to a buddy's place in Portland. Figured I'd lie low for a while, let my head clear. Two weeks in the city did wonders for my sanity, but I couldn't stay away forever. The cabin was my home. So I steeled myself, stocked up on ammo, and made the drive back. My first week there was tense. I jumped at every crack of a twig and barely slept. But nothing happened. No more blood trails, no nightmares. 
I began to think I'd imagined the whole thing. Maybe it really was just a fever dream brought on by too much isolation. That false sense of security didn't last. It was a couple of nights ago in the deep dark of the early morning when I heard it. A scratching sound at my window. It jerked me awake, and I fumbled for the pistol I kept under my pillow. My heart pounded in my ears as I crept to the window and peered outside. The moon hung low, casting everything in long, eerie shadows. At first I saw nothing. Then, from behind my woodpile, a figure emerged. It was massive, taller than any man. The hulking limbs were too long, ending in sharp, ragged claws. Its head was twisted at an unnatural angle, those mismatched eyes staring directly at me. It was exactly the thing from my nightmares. It moved, not with an animalistic stride, but with a grotesque series of twitches and lurches. With a hiss that made my blood freeze, the creature charged. I fired my pistol, the muzzle flashes lighting up the room. It roared a deafening inhuman sound but seemed unfazed by the bullets. In a flash, it was at the window, shattering the glass. I fired again, point blank, and stumbled backward, tripping over an overturned chair. The creature crashed through the window, its stench filling the room. I rolled to the side, barely avoiding a swipe from its claws that shredded my mattress. I could see the hunger twisting its features, the drool dripping from its broken teeth. I scrambled to my feet and ran toward the kitchen, grabbing the hunting rifle I kept by the door. The creature was fast, scuttling across the floor like a monstrous spider. I turned and fired, the blast knocking it back and tearing a hole in its shoulder. Still, it advanced. I stumbled into the backyard, frantically trying to reload the rifle. My hands trembled, fumbling with the cartridges. From the darkness, it launched itself at me. I got the rifle half-raised, but it was too late. The creature slammed into me, knocking me flat to the ground. The rifle flew from my grip. Claws dug into my chest as I kicked blindly, trying to shove the creature off me. Its rancid breath washed over my face. My hand brushed against a rock. I grabbed it, desperation fueling me. I swung it blindly, feeling it connect with a crunch. The creature screeched, loosening its grip on me for a moment. I brought the rock down again, smashing it into the thing's face, and then again and again. I don't know how long I battered it. My vision was blurring, and I could feel warmth spreading under me, my own blood soaking the ground. Finally, with a choked, inhuman gurgle, the creature sagged, its limbs going slack. I lay there, gasping for air. My body screamed in protest with each shaky breath. Somehow, I pushed myself upright and forced my legs to move. I stumbled toward the cabin, searching for the pistol I'd dropped. The thing twitched on the ground. I dared not get closer. Instead, I emptied the pistol into it until the gunfire echoed into silence. Only then did I collapse. I think I passed out, or my mind finally gave in to the shock. I'm not even sure how much time passed. When I woke, the sun was up. I was still lying outside my cabin, my body stiff and sore. My chest throbbed where the creature had clawed me. The wounds were shallow, but I knew in my gut if I hadn't stopped it when I did, they'd have been a whole lot deeper. I managed to drag myself inside and clean myself up. My first aid supplies weren't much, but I did the best I could. Then, exhausted to my bones, I crawled into my ruined bed and sank into a deep, merciful sleep. When I woke again, it was to the sound of sirens. I called the sheriff's office from my landline. I told them about the man on the side of the road 
the cab and my dog, and, well, the rest they saw for themselves. They found the creature where I left it, barely recognizable as something that was once alive. I described it as best I could, knowing they'd think I was crazy. State biologists were called in, but they couldn't determine what it was. Some mutation, they theorized, or maybe an unknown species deep from the parts of the woods where people rarely tread. The tabloids had a field day, but as soon as the story faded and the body disappeared into some lab, so did the attention. Now it's been dismissed as a hoax, or mass hysteria, or some drug-fueled delusion from a crazy hermit. It took me weeks to recover from my wounds. The nightmares persisted, although they're not as vivid these days. My cabin is a wreck. I guess I need to do some repairs before winter comes. But I don't know if I can stay. The woods don't feel like home anymore. Every creak of my floors, every rustling of leaves outside sends shivers down my spine. I've put up extra floodlights, motion detectors, and cameras around the property. It's excessive, I know, but I can't get the image of that creature out of my mind, the feel of its claws, that piercing gaze. They say there's no evidence for whatever story I'm spinning. But there's no evidence explaining what actually happened either. I've called some realtors, started to make inquiries about selling. Maybe I'll head down south for a while, someplace sunny and crowded. City life never appealed to me before but I can't stand the isolation anymore. I know I haven't seen the last of it. Part of me is relieved I'm leaving. At least if that thing comes back, it won't find me here. But another part of me is terrified. I've heard stories, rumors whispered about creatures like it existing all over the country. Some old Native American folklore calls them skinwalkers. Others call them wendigos or rakes. The names change, but the stories remain the same, misshapen, monstrous things hunting at the edges of civilization. Sometimes, in those restless half-waking moments, I swear I can hear scratching on my roof. I jump out of bed and search the security feeds, but nothing's ever there. I still see its eyes staring out from the tree line, peering from the darkness. And I know, deep down, wherever I go, those eyes will follow. January 15, 2002 The ice storm snapped branches outside my cabin. Eight years I lived out here in the Olympic National Forest and never heard anything like it. Figured I should humor myself, check if a tree threatened the roof. Makes about as much sense as most things I do. I'm Wes Carter, by the way. Ex-military, got more issues than a newsstand. That's why I'm out here. I threw the old army coat over my thermals, the one with a hole where I took a round back in the day. Stepped outside, cold hitting me like a fist. Snow whirled around under the porch light, and the trees groaned in that new, dangerous way. I scanned the tree line, then started back towards the door. That's when I saw it. A splash of red against the white, right at the edge of the light. Blood. And something crumpled in a drift. I grabbed my rifle from inside, an instinct, and eased toward the shape. He wasn't some lost hiker. This guy, Jason, his dog Tag said, had the look of the hunted. Throat ripped, eyes wide in that way only the dead get. One arm was bent at the elbow like a twig snapped backward. Animal attack? Too clean for a bear or cougar. Too brutal. Suddenly, I was back checking corners in cobble, the adrenaline singing in my veins. I scanned the woods, saw nothing but the bending branches and swirling snow. No tracks around the body to show what got him. Yet I know someone, or something, was out there. 
I dragged Jason inside, the floorboards under his boots slick with blood. He had a campsite not far going by his gear, ripped up. Whatever did this was strong, and Jason wasn't a small guy. The next morning felt wrong, the trees too still after the storm. I made coffee on the old wood stove, the bitter smell somehow comforting. Had to make a decision. Hike the half-day out to the ranger station? Risk encountering whatever did this to Jason? I kept seeing his eyes, and my hands shook with something other than the cold. Then I saw movement at the tree line. My heart hammered a rhythm against my ribs. A figure too tall, too lean to be human. Moving on all fours, but somehow upright. Grayish hide, thick as a bear's. And antlers. Not deer antlers, these were wicked and wide. The gun. I had the gun. I fired once, the shot cracking the silence, but the thing barely slowed. It turned a yellow eye toward me, and then vanished into the trees. That decided it. I wasn't sticking around to be some creature's next meal. Grabbed a few days of supplies, my warmest gear, left most everything else. Couldn't risk the noise of chopping wood this far out, so I bundled up, left Jason where he lay, and hit the trail. Days blurred together. Snow hid my tracks, and I prayed that would hide me too. Didn't hike at night, too much risk of twisting an ankle and becoming easy prey. Instead, I found caves or rocky shelters, slept fitfully, dreams full of yellow eyes and cracking branches. The way out of the forest is tricky, even under the best circumstances. Hunger gnawed at me, made me weak, made me take risks. One afternoon, I smelled smoke, a campfire. I almost cried with relief. Humans. Help. Then I crept closer, and what I saw made my blood freeze. A camp, tents ripped open, food containers scattered and not. No bodies, but blood painted the snow like grotesque finger painting. And in the center of it all was a rough-hewn wooden statue. Deer bones and antlers, roughly lashed together in the shape of a man. An offering? The message came through loud and clear. This wasn't bear or wolf country anymore. This was its territory. I didn't run that time. Ran out of fuel for it. Just walked, numb, into those dark woods. It found me two nights later. I heard it circling my pitiful shelter under a rock overhang. I smelled it. That rank animal stink cut with something sour and wrong. Could make out the gleam of its eye in the dark. Death came on teeth and claws, quick and brutal like Jason's end, I thought. But it didn't come. It toyed. A swipe across my leg, tearing my pants, raking skin. A low, rumbling sound, a growl, or maybe laughter. Then it was gone the snapping of branches fading into the distance. I made it out, somehow. Found a half-frozen creek, followed it to a logging road, flagged down a truck eventually. They looked at me like I was crazy, the ragged beard, haunted eyes, the shredded leg wound. Told them a bear attacked me. They believed it, more or less. Didn't matter. Never went back. Found a rundown apartment in Seattle, and hid. Jobs under the table where no one asked too many questions. Booze helped for a while. Nightmares never stopped. Sometimes still swear I see those twisted antlers in the shadows of an alley, that yellow eye. Years now. I think it spared me to tell the story. A warning, maybe? Or just cruel? If you're ever deep in the Olympic, and you see something tall like a man, but not a man, antlers instead of a head, run. And pray it doesn't think he'd make a good trophy. They call it the Olympic man around these parts. Legend passed among hunters and hikers. 
Maybe it's real, maybe it's not. Me? I know what I saw. And what it did. March 23, 2010 I was working some seasonal construction gig and finally saved enough to get that plot of land up in the Alaskan backcountry. Been dreaming of doing it proper since I was a kid, you know? Getting off the grid, living free. Name's Everett, Everett Barnes. Folks called me Ev, but out there, I was just me. First year was a rude awakening. I ain't ashamed to admit it. Thought I knew survival stuff, camping trips, hunting with my old man in the backwoods of Michigan. Alaska? That was an entirely different beast. Winter came down like a hammer. My woodpile wasn't nearly big enough. Cabin was draftier than I thought. I nearly packed it in. Could have driven my beat-up truck back down south, swallowed my pride. But something in me kept going. Learned from my mistakes, got resourceful. Second year was better, third year even more so. By that fifth year, I felt like I finally got the hang of it. My garden was doing great. I'd set up a smokehouse, even made friends with a few folks from the nearest small town a half-day's hike away. Life was simple, even lonely sometimes, but it was mine. Then the day came when everything changed. I was headed down to the river to check my fishing lines. It was still early spring, the meltwater high and fast. Figured the trout might be biting. I'd gotten careless. No gun, not even a big knife, since it was such a familiar route. My first mistake. Heard a sound that set my teeth on edge. Kind of a chittering, like nothing I'd encountered before. Then a low growl echoed through the trees, deeper than a bear. That's when the smell hit me, a sickly, rotten kind of stink that made me gag. I didn't wait around to find out what made it. I took off running, heart pounding so loud I was afraid it would give me away. Tripped over a root, slammed my knee on a rock. Didn't matter. I scrambled up, tasting blood in my mouth. Kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting something. Problem was, I still had no idea what I was running from. Busted through the trees onto the river bank and froze. My fishing line wasn't just caught, it had been shredded. And something left a trophy. Laid out across a flat rock was the head of a buck. I recognized it, belonged to a deer that had been hanging around my cabin. Its eyes stared wide and empty. But the head, it was mostly clean of flesh. Like something gnawed the meat down to the bone. Suddenly a rustle from upstream. I turned just in time to see it. Crouched on a boulder, hunched like it was made of too many angles. Tall, at least eight feet, with scrawny limbs that ended in long, yellowish claws. Its skin was leathery and dark like tree bark. And the head, it was the stuff of nightmares. Kind of like a wolf, but twisted all wrong, the snout too long and the teeth too sharp, like rows of razors. The creature stared at me with eyes that glowed a sickly yellow. It let out a hissing snarl, then sprang. I barely had time to dive into the river. The icy water shocked the breath out of me, but it didn't slow that that thing down. It crashed into the shallows, the water churning. I swam frantic, the current helping and hindering me all at once. I expected a swipe of claws, the sudden pain of being dragged under. But nothing came. I risked a look over my shoulder. That creature was on the bank, pacing. It howled, the sound echoing off the hillsides and then it vanished back into the forest. It took me hours to find my way back to the cabin. I stumbled in, bolted the door, and collapsed onto my bed, 
shivering even with blankets piled on top of me. Next morning, I surveyed the damage. Footprints circled the cabin, big as dinner plates, the clawed toes deeply imprinted in the mud. No way an animal I knew could leave tracks like that. I also found a trail of thick, brownish blood leading away into the woods. Seemed at least I managed to wound the thing. I cleaned up as best I could then packed a bag. There was no way I was staying. Whatever that creature was, I didn't want another round with it. I left behind most of my stuff, years of work. Didn't care. I hiked out of there like a bat out of hell. Never looked back. When I finally got to town, I found a bar and drank until I couldn't see straight. Some guys overheard me ranting about a monster in the woods. Laughed at me, called me crazy. I let them. Got some odd jobs, saved up enough to get as far away from Alaska as possible. Found myself down near the Florida swamps of all places. Figured if anything wanted to eat me alive, at least the gators would be familiar company. Still see that creature in my nightmares, though. Hear it snarls, smell that rotten stink. People tell me to put it behind me, like it was some bad dream. But I know what I saw. They even have a name for it, those who believe, the Adlet. Some Inuit legend about a shape-shifting beast with a hunger for human flesh. Maybe I'm crazy now. Maybe I was always crazy enough to think I could take on the Alaskan wilderness alone. All I know is this. There are things in this world that don't fit into neat little nature documentaries. Things that remind you that even when you think you're the hunter, you might just be the prey. September 8th, 1991 I still remember because it's the day my little brother would have turned 15. Instead, he's under six feet of dirt thanks to a drunk driver. That's part of why I ended up out here, in this cabin in the Boundary Waters. Figured if the city could chew up and spit out someone like him, it could do the same to me. I'm Rory, by the way. Ex-carpenter. X lot of things. Been seven years living off grid now, hunting, fishing, growing what I can. I thought I got the hang of it, the rhythms of this place. But you always get cocky at some point. It'll be the death of me, I'm sure of it. November meant stocking up for the lean months. I had a good haul of venison, needed to smoke the last of it before it turned. The smoker was a good hike from the cabin, reduced fire risk, and kept the smell away from the curious critters. I set out that morning with the meat, a clear sky overhead. The forest was that special kind of quiet you only get before the first snowfall, the crunch of leaves under my boots the loudest thing around. That's what made me hear the snap so clearly. Not a deer, too heavy. Not a bear, too crisp of a sound. I froze, the rifle gripped tight in my hands. Scanned the trees, saw nothing. Figured I was jumping at shadows. Got the smoker loaded, fire going. As the smoke curled upwards, I heard it again. Branches shifting, footfalls. Something circling just out of sight. City living didn't leave a lot of room for imagination but I'd spent enough time out here to remember the old stories. Skinwalkers, Wendigos, things best left unnamed. Told myself they were just that, stories to scare the kids. Didn't stop my pulse hammering in my ears. Had to get back to the cabin, the safety of four walls. Even the flimsy cabin seemed better than the woods suddenly full of eyes I couldn't see. That's when the screaming started came from the north end of the trail, cut off as quick as it began. I didn't hesitate. I knew those woods better than anyone. I sprinted through them, 
The rifle clutched tight, breath tearing at my lungs. Found him near one of the old logging roads, Becker, I think his name was. He was in bad shape. Leg twisted wrong, blood everywhere, and his eyes, he kept looking behind me, like whatever got him was still on his tail. Tried to ask him what happened, but he barely got a few words out before his chest rattled and he went still. I looked back the way I came, half expecting to see some kind of beast crashing through the trees. But there was nothing. Just the silent forest and the darkening sky. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I couldn't leave Becker's body to the scavengers, even with the sun getting low. Hauled him as best I could back to the cabin, swore the whole way. Got him on the porch, figured I'd bury him in the morning. Exhaustion hit me then, heavy as a bear pressing down. I went inside, locked the door, didn't feel a bit safer for it. Sleep wouldn't come. Every creak of the cabin, every rustle of the wind, sounded like claws on the roof. I thought about Becker again, the way he looked at the empty woods behind me as he died. That's when I decided, come morning, I was leaving. Stuff that couldn't fit in my pack I'd burn. I'd walk until I found another soul, or until my feet gave out. No way I was staying after what happened. Morning light revealed more horror. Blood smeared on my porch steps. Drag marks leading down the trail towards the woods. There were footprints, but not like any I'd seen, four-toed, big as my hand. Becker was gone, taken by whatever made those tracks. I threw whatever I needed in my pack, doused the cabin in kerosene, and struck a match. Didn't look back as its familiar shape went up in flames. The next weeks are a blur. Walking, sleeping rough, that constant prickle at the back of my neck telling me it was following. Once or twice I swore I saw movement at the edge of my vision. Tall, gangly, darting between the trees. Never got a clear look. Rain turned to sleep, then snow. I was losing ground and losing hope. Then, near twilight, I saw the lights of a highway off in the distance. Salvation. I ran towards those lights, stumbled out of the trees. Flagged down a pickup truck, an old farmer with a face lined like a walnut. Told him I was lost, needed to get to the nearest town. He eyed me, my ragged beard, the desperation in my eyes, but he didn't ask any questions. Just told me to climb in. As we drove, he started talking. Hunting season. Talked about some buddies of his tracking a buck. They'd found tracks, though. Not deer tracks that the old-timers were muttering about the goat man. I felt my gut clench. He glanced at me then, a knowing sort of look. Said the goat man was just talk best not listen to. I said nothing. We reached a town finally, gas station lights blurring through the tears in my eyes. I think the farmer one last time, stumbled into the grimy restroom, and locked myself in a stall. When I looked in the cracked mirror, I barely recognized myself. Eyes wild, hair matted. It had seen me, that thing. I'd seen its sign, and now I was marked. The city might not have been safe, but at least I could disappear in it. I washed the grime of the woods off my face, walked out of there unnoticed by anyone. Figured I'd hop a train or a bus, go anywhere. It couldn't follow me to the edge of the country, could it? Sometimes, in the dead of night when I can't sleep, I see the trees outside my window swaying with unseen movement. I hear the crunch of leaves that aren't there. I know, somewhere out there in those deep woods, the goat man waits. And I wait too, wondering if this time he'll finish what he started. July 9th, 
1996. Funny, how a date can burn itself into your brain. I was building a cabin then, out in the Ozarks. Always had that itch to live on my own terms, away from the rat race. They call folks like me survivalists, sometimes preppers. Most are harmless, a little eccentric, maybe. Me? I'm Cal, Cal Warren. Ex-military, got more practical skills than those TV guys with their fancy bunkers. My cabin was a ways off any beaten path. Took days just to hike in when I first scouted out the area. Perfect spot. Game trails, creek for water, a hidden valley the mapmakers seemed to have missed. I'd been working on the cabin for months, feeling cocky with my progress. That's the thing about the wilderness. It's got a funny way of knocking the arrogance right out of you. The change in the air was what first alerted me. Not a storm, those I could sense but a shift in the rhythm of the place. Animals got skittish, birds went quiet. I started checking my traps and snares more often, that nameless unease itching under my skin. Few nights later I heard it. A howl, but not from any wolf or coyote I recognized. Louder, carrying a strange echo to it, like it bounced off the hillsides. Sent a shiver down my spine. Built up the fire outside my half-finished cabin, like the flames could ward off whatever was out there. Didn't sleep much that night. Morning revealed the first sign of trouble. One of my snares was tripped. Whatever went for the bait was strong enough to break the cord. That was good, heavy-duty stuff. I found dragged marks going into the trees, and something else. Blood. Dark and too much of it for a rabbit or possum. Got my rifle, followed that blood trail slow and careful. Didn't want to be surprised. Found the source soon enough. What remained of a wild hog, half-eaten, the carcass torn open like paper. That was unsettling, but it was the other tracks that stopped me cold. Bigger than my hand, with long claw marks. Mountain lion, maybe? Didn't sit right, not for this area. I headed back to camp feeling jumpy, like eyes were on me the whole way. Next few nights were worse. That howl kept circling the valley, closer each time. One morning, I found a fresh deer carcass near my creek. Picked clean, except for what looked like gnaw marks on the bones. Something was hungry out there and getting bolder. Then came the evening I ran out of firewood. Bad planning on my part. Sun was getting low, and those Ozark nights turned cold. I cursed myself, grabbed my axe, and headed into the trees. Found a deadfall with mostly solid branches. Just as I started chopping, I heard the snap of a twig behind me. I whirled, rifle raised, for a heart-stopping moment, there was nothing. Then, movement at the edge of my vision. It crouched low in the shadows, watching me. I ain't ashamed to say, I gasped. Never seen anything like it. Tall, even hunched, with long, fur-covered limbs that seemed almost too skinny. Yellow eyes shone in the dusk. The head was like a wolf's skull stretched wrong, snout too long teeth like a shark's. It let out a low, guttural growl and bared those teeth. Then, it smiled at me. Not like a friendly smile, you understand. More like, it found something funny. I fired a warning shot into the air. The creature flinched, then let out a shriek that made my eardrums ring. It vanished into the trees with unnatural speed. I finished chopping that wood in record time, heart pounding like a drum solo. Back at the cabin, I knew I wasn't safe. That wasn't a natural predator. Something twisted. Got what I needed, doused my fire, and hiked out by the light of the moon. Didn't matter how unfinished the cabin was, getting away was priority one. 
I walked until dawn, found a mostly deserted logging road, and flagged down a passing truck. Driver looked at me like I was crazy, unshaven, wild-eyed, toting a rifle and a backpack. He probably thought I was some escaped convict. Got me to the nearest town, though. Tried telling the sheriff what I saw, but he didn't believe a word. Said it was probably a bear, or maybe poachers. Never went back to those woods. Sold the land off cheap. Sometimes, that ain't such a bad definition of survival, knowing when to cut your losses. Folks don't like mysteries in their neck of the woods. They chalk it up to tall tales, animal attacks. But some nights, I hear that howl sliding through my dreams, and see that unnatural grin. They have a word for it, some of the old-timers in those parts. Ozar Collar. Say it stalks the deep woods, a creature of hunger and shadow. Me, I don't care what you call it. All I know is, there are things in this world that civilized men ain't meant to understand. Things that remind you just how fragile our place on the food chain really is. March 18th, 2003 I spent the last eight years up here, mostly off the grid, and most days I figure I must be the luckiest guy alive. They call me Finn. Used to be a mechanic back in Seattle. Greasy coveralls, noisy shop, all of it. Then my old man passed, left me his cabin tucked away in the Olympic Peninsula. Figured it was as good a time as any to chuck it all, see if I could live a simpler life. Truth is, city life was starting to grind me down. The cabin's small, nothing fancy, but it keeps me dry. I got the old wood stove working, a generator for when I absolutely need power, and a well that hits good water. Grow my own garden, hunt deer and turkey to fill the freezer. There's a creek nearby for fishing if I get the itch. Town's a two-day hike if I run low on supplies, but usually, I got everything I need right here. Day like today, sun shining and a breeze in the old growth trees, can't imagine being anywhere else. I decide to take the rifle and hike to the ridge, maybe spot a good buck for fall hunting. The air's thin up there, and the views are hard to beat. I'm heading up the trail when I spot something through the trees. Figure it's a black bear, seen them around before, usually rooting around for grubs. But this thing didn't move like a bear. It stood on two legs, tall and lanky. My first thought was some idiot wandered up into the woods without the right gear. Then it turned slightly, and I see it clear through my scope. My blood ran cold. No person looked like that. Skin was a sickly gray, tight over bone. The head was small, topped with horns, not the big rack of a deer, more like sharp, curved spikes. Sunken eyes that were pure black, looking right my way even from that distance. What freaked me the most was its mouth, long and split in a grin far too wide, filled with too many teeth. I don't remember dropping the rifle, but it clattered on some rocks. The sound must have sent that thing skittering into the brush, like a startled deer. But it ran upright on those spindly legs, moving with a loping, wrong kind of movement that twisted my stomach into knots. I stood there, frozen, for God knows how long. Finally worked up the courage to retrieve my rifle, then hightailed it back to the cabin. Never looked back once. I wasn't scared exactly. Scared's when you know the danger can judge it. This was different like that primal fear a mouse has of an owl, something unnatural in the world. Double locked the cabin door that night, even though I knew it wouldn't keep that thing out if it was hungry. Hardly slept, rifle by my bed, every creak of the trees sounding like footsteps approaching. Next morning, 
I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. Walked out to the garden and found it trampled. Whatever did it left tracks bigger than my hand, with long, unnatural claws. I found a half-eaten rabbit nearby. Carcass chewed like it was nothing. The gnaw marks on the bones. They weren't right for any predator I knew. I'm no stranger to the back country. Seen plenty of things that make city folks uneasy. But this was a whole different level. I tried to convince myself I was overreacting, hadn't seen clearly. Problem was, something deep down knew I couldn't explain it away. Then, that night, I heard it. A scratching at the cabin walls. Followed by a low growl a kind of inhuman snarl that made the hair prickle on my neck. I stayed put in my bed, rifle aimed at the door, the whole night. It never tried to get in. Like it was toying with me. Come sunrise, I packed my things. Left most of my tools, most of my food stores. Couldn't risk going back, not after that. Hitched a ride out of town with some loggers. Found a cheap apartment in Tacoma. Went back to working on cars. It ain't the life I wanted, but it's a life. Nightmares keep me up sometimes. I wake up all sweaty, hearing those claws on wood, seeing those empty eyes in the shadows. It took me months before I could even say the word out loud, skinwalker. That's what the old-timers around here called it. Said it was a bad spirit an evil thing that took the shape of an animal, but twisted all wrong. Reckon they're right. I don't try to explain it to anyone anymore. They see a quiet old mechanic, figure I'm simple. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm crazy. All I know is, I saw something in those woods, something that ought not to exist. And for once in my life, I ran, and I ain't never going back. October 17, 2012 I was out on one of my property surveys. Folks around here call me Miller, Miller Scott. Used to work for the county, mapping boundaries and zoning and such. Got laid off when the budget dried up, same old story. But even with my official hat gone, I had those skills ingrained in me. So... I took to doing the same freelance for private landowners. Pays the bills and gets me out in the woods. That's my kind of place to be, always has been. Dad took me hunting before I could walk straight. He wasn't the sentimental type, but he loved those deep woods, loved the silence of him. I inherited that. City life, with all its noise and rush, made my skin crawl. Out where the cell reception drops off and the pines close and overhead, that's where I felt right. This particular job was way out in the Gila National Forest. Big Spread Klein had dreams of a hunting lodge, the kind where guys with more money than cents pay a fortune to bag a trophy buck. My job was simpler. Map the terrain, mark access points, locate any old logging trails for him. Should have been a breeze, few days' work. Thing is, nature don't care about your deadlines. The weather turned on the first afternoon. One minute it's bluebird skies, the next there's a low rumble of thunder, and the air goes still. Then the rain hits, coming down sideways, the kind that soaks you through in seconds. Not a safe place to be with a metal surveyor's pole, so I start looking for shelter. Find a kind of cave, more like a hollow in the rock face, just big enough to squeeze into. As I settle in, I notice it's odd. The floor of the cave is clean. No pine needles, no dust, like it had been swept bare. Should have taken that as a sign. But I just figure some animal made it a den, no big deal. Then I smell it. A rank, musty smell 
not like anything you normally find out in the woods. Kind of like old meat left too long in the sun, with a sickly sweet edge to it that makes my gorge rise. My hand goes to the flashlight clipped on my belt. I shine it deep into the cave, ready to startle a grumpy bear or something. What I see isn't a bear. Hunkered down near the back is a creature is the only word I can think of. Tall, at least eight feet, and hunched over, its skin stretched tight over bone, like the walking dead. It's hairless, with a grayish-brown hide that looks tough and leathery. The head is the size of a basketball balanced on that scrawny neck, dominated by a snout that's longer than it ought to be. And God help me, two nubs like broken horns poking up from the skull. But the worst are the eyes. Big, sunken black holes that seem to swallow the light, and somehow, they feel like they're staring right through me. Creature hisses, a high-pitched screech that echoes in the small space. I stumble back, tripping and falling on my equipment. The clatter must set the thing off, because it moves, faster than I thought possible for its ungainly shape. I'm scrambling back on my feet, hard a trip hammer in my chest. The creature lunges, but it's still mostly in darkness, and I'm already scrambling out towards the daylight. I hear claws scraping on rock behind me, but it doesn't give chase. Must be one of those cave dwellers, the kind the sun hurts. Spend the rest of that day soaked and shaking under a tarp, radio out of range, no way to call for help. Figure if I die of hypothermia, it'll at least be a quicker way to go than whatever that thing has planned. Finally, the storm eases, and I get the hell out of there as fast as I can. Figured the landowner could find someone else to finish the job. Made my way back to the truck, drove like a madman until I found a roadhouse with a payphone. Called the Forest Service. Told them everything I saw. Didn't care if they thought I was crazy. The ranger on the line didn't laugh, exactly. Said they had reports of sightings in the area from time to time. Said it probably wouldn't bother me if I steered clear of those parts. He also said the caves up in the Gila are old. Lots of unexplored passages. Things could live down there unseen. Stuff of nightmares, right? I never went back to finish that survey. Some money ain't worth the price. Left the county a few months later, found work elsewhere. But sometimes, at night, I dream of clawed feet scrabbling on stone, and I wake up in a cold sweat smelling that rotten meat stench. People in these parts give it a name, that creature I saw, the goat man. Reckon that's as good of a name as any. I know this much. There are places in the wild, forgotten and untouched, where the rules of the world we know don't quite hold. Sometimes the old stories, the ones whispered around campfires, have a grain of truth in them. Truth best left undisturbed. I always check my mirrors now, walking out to the truck, even in broad daylight. See every flicker of movement in the trees as a loping shape. I'll never go back to those woods alone. You might think that makes me a coward, or that I lost my nerve. The truth is simpler. Some things, once you see them, you can't unsee. Makes you understand that we humans ain't the top of the food chain. Not everywhere. Not always. November 8th, 1991. Folks up here call me Hayes, Hayes Griffin. I've been working these mountains trapping and logging since I was old enough to hold an axe. I know the backwoods around the boundary waters like the back of my hand. Or so I thought. Thing is, there are places out there where maps don't mean much, and a man's knowledge can turn against him. Pride can get you killed out here. This was back when I was trapping, mostly beaver and muskrat. 
had a lion eye ran deep in the woods, old cabins marking the spots to check. Wasn't a bad life, if a solitary one. One morning, mid-season, I was heading to the farthest cabin, the one folks said was haunted, but nobody I knew had ever seen proof. I figured it was drifters and moonshiners, using it on the sly, so I kept extra alert. Should have listened to that prickling at the back of my neck. Wasn't long into the hike when I caught the smell. Now I've dealt with gut piles, skunks, all the stink nature can throw at you. This was wrong. Like something rotten, left in the sun too long, with a chemical sweetness underneath that made me want to puke. Figured it must be a dead deer somewhere off trail. Happens sometimes. Predator gets it, but doesn't finish the meal. Kept going, rifle grip tight, the smell growing stronger. Then I rounded a bend, and there it was, right in the middle of the path. The deer carcass, or what was left of it. Mangled, half the meat torn away, bones splintered. The fur around the wounds was blackened, like it had been burned. Didn't make sense. Coyote pack, maybe, if they were starving, but even they don't leave a mess like this. I circled wide, eyes on the tree line. That's when I saw the tracks. I grew up finding sign, knew my deer from my bear, wolf from dog. These prints, they weren't right. Bigger than my boot, but with only four toes. Claws look long, maybe three inches, and the gait, it was off kilter, not like any animal I knew. That's when it hit me. That god-awful stench from before, it was all around me, only stronger. I didn't stick around to investigate. Checked my trap line, but couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. Whatever left those tracks, it knew I was there. Back at the cabin that night I heard it. A howl, longer and higher pitched than a wolf's. It echoed off the hillsides, making it seem like the sound was coming from every direction at once. Then came something else, something worse, a high-pitched screech, like a woman screaming in pain. I built up the fire, shotgun loaded with buckshot laid across my lap. Didn't sleep much? I told myself they were just sounds, tricks the wind plays in these old forests. But that smell, those tracks, they haunted my dreams all the same. Morning came, and I hiked back with the first light, didn't want to stay another night. Had to pass that carcass again. It was gone. Not dragged off, gone. Like it had walked itself away, even half-eaten as it was. I ran the rest of that line, traps untouched. Never went back to that cabin, not even to pick up my gear. Some lines aren't worth running, some places aren't worth the risk. I learned something out there. There are corners in these woods, dark corners, where the old stories might be true. The stories about things with too many teeth and eyes that glow like embers in the dark. Things that walk upright, but ain't human. I ran into a park ranger a few weeks later, on my way to new trapping grounds. Told him what I saw, about the carcass, the tracks figured it was worth reporting, might be a new predator or something diseased. That ranger, he didn't laugh. Just got that grim look in his eye that old-timers around here sometimes get, then said, Sounds like you had yourself a run-in with the dogman. Said there were sightings going back generations, native legends too. Said he didn't believe it, not fully, but that he'd seen some things that made him wonder. I don't wonder anymore. I've seen proof that the world's a hair bigger, and a lot darker than we think. I stick to logging now, working with crews safer that way. Sometimes, though... I dream about that scream and the smell of rot. I wake up, look over to my old hunting dog curled up by the fire, and try to pretend he could protect me from the things that slip through the shadows. From the things that might have a name, 
but are better left unspoken. July 5th, 2008 They call me Wilder, Jebediah Wilder. Don't get many folks with names like that these days. I'm ex-military, got out with a bum knee and some bad memories rattling around in my head. Figured a little off-grid cabin life in the Alaskan bush was the way to find some peace, or maybe at least forget the noise of the city for a while. I got my land cheap out near Denali, built the cabin myself. I figured if I could handle the desert, I could handle a taste of the north country. Boy, was I wrong. First winter was rough. It's one thing to read about the cold, another thing entirely to live in it. The kind that seeps into your bones. But I got through it, got better at chopping wood, keeping the stove going all night. Started feeling like this place might work out for me. Then came April. Snow was melting, things were getting sloppy. It was early evening, and I was walking back up the trail from the creek. Had a good haul of trout, enough for a few days. That's when I saw the tracks. I froze. These weren't bear, moose, or anything I recognized. The prints were huge each toe leaving an indent in the mud. The claws dug deep, almost like the earth was too soft to hold whatever made those tracks something about the shape of it set my teeth on edge, like my body knew danger before my brain did. There was no sign of the creature itself, just the tracks leading deeper into the woods. I got a prickle down my spine, the feeling of being watched. Didn't waste any time getting back to the cabin, shotgun laid across the table. Didn't sleep a wink that night. Morning, I thought maybe I'd overreacted. Daylight does that to a man sometimes. Then I stepped outside and found a half-eaten rabbit carcass on the porch. It had been gutted and torn. Ragged chunks of flesh were scattered around on the snow. And there were those tracks again a whole mess of them all around the cabin. Like it had spent the night pacing, circling, just out of sight. Then I saw a smear of blood on the cabin wall. Too high for a wolf, or even a bear on its hind legs. Whatever did this was tall. Maybe eight feet tall, if I had to guess. I went back inside, packed up the stuff I couldn't afford to lose. Took my rifle, strapped on my snowshoes, and headed into the woods. Figured if something wanted me that bad, it would find me eventually. I wasn't about to wait around like a sitting duck. Besides, I had some skills. I knew how to track. I followed the trail, which wasn't hard given the mess this thing made stomping through the trees. I saw where it had dragged something heavy, there were streaks of blood on the snow, bits of fur. My stomach roiled. Maybe another rabbit, maybe something bigger. About a mile from the cabin, I found the source of the blood. What was left of a deer? Bones shattered, fur in clumps. And something else, something that sent a fresh wave of panic through me. Handprints in the bloody snow. Enormous handprints, shaped all wrong. The fingers were too long, tipped with black claws, and there was an extra thumb, pointing backwards. My mind kept trying to make sense of it, fit it into a rational shape. There, deformed maybe, but deep down, I knew that wasn't right. I kept going, figuring maybe I'd kill this thing, make it pay for whatever it was doing in these woods. Cocky, stupid thinking, the kind that gets greenhorns dead. But I was mad, and scared, and that's a dangerous mix. Came across a cave entrance an hour later. I approached cautiously, rifle raised. Place stank something fierce, that rancid, rotting smell that was starting to get familiar. That's when something lunged out of the darkness. I only got a glimpse, but it was enough. This thing, 
It moved like a man, but hunched over, limbs all out of proportion. Its skin was leathery and dark, like it had no fur. Its head was dog-like, too long in the snout, with eyes that glowed a hellish yellow. It hissed at me, bearing a mouthful of needle-sharp teeth. I fired. Hit it square in the shoulder, should have staggered it. But this thing just let out a screech that rattled my eardrums and vanished back into the cave. I wasn't stupid enough to follow. Backtracked to my cabin, gathered the rest of my stuff, and hightailed it out of there until I hit the nearest road. Flagged down a trucker, told him my car broke down, needed a ride to the nearest town. He looked at me funny, probably smelled the fear on me, but I didn't care. Ended up back in Anchorage, drinking myself into a stupor in seedy bars. All the peace I'd found shattered. Took me months before I could even think about the woods without breaking out in a cold sweat. Sometimes I'd wake up yelling from nightmares about those glowing eyes in the dark. Folks hear my story, they say. Ah, you must have seen the Bushmen. Turns out these sightings go way back, native legends even. Bigfoot's nasty cousin, they say. Only thing is, Bigfoot stories, those are mostly about a shy giant who keeps to himself. Whatever I saw in those woods, that was a hunter. A killer. I knew it, and that damn thing knew it too. Some places in this world ain't meant for men, I reckon. Some shadows are best left undisturbed. September 4th, 1997. I'm a hunter. Name's Grady, Grady Olson. Been roaming the woods my whole life. Dad taught me how to track, how to gut a deer, how to quiet my steps so no critter would hear me coming. He used to say I moved like a ghost through the trees. I never thought those skills would come in handy the way they did. Up in the main backcountry, there's a patch of wilderness most folks steer clear of. Old-timers called it the Devil's Tramping Ground, got its name from strange disappearances back in the logging days. They'd find men crushed, half-eaten, like something real big snatched them up and went to town. Reckon I've always had a streak of stubborn in me. Figured those were just tall tales, and I was more than capable. Had a cabin up that way, not much, just a place to stay warm during deer season. One morning, mid-season, I went out for a hunt, just myself and my rifle. Day was clear, sun shining through that crisp fall air. Felt good to be out there. I was following a creek bed, trying to pick up signs of a good-sized buck. Heard a snap of a twig behind me. I froze, then turned slow but there was nothing there. Another snap, closer this time. That's when the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I knew with a gut certainty that I wasn't alone. I wasn't the hunter out here anymore. I was being hunted. I started moving faster, but trying to keep my footsteps quiet. Every sound in the woods seemed magnified, every rustle of leaves, every squirrel chattering, all of it sent a chill down my spine. Something was following me, matching my pace through the trees. My breath came in short gasps as I reached a clearing. Seemed like a good place to make a stand. I whirled around, rifle raised, and saw nothing. I thought maybe I'd lost my mind out there, but then I looked down at the ground. There were footprints pressed deep into the soft earth too big to be a man's misshapen. The toes were all wrong, some freakishly long, and the claws, they were bigger than anything a bear could leave. My hunter's instincts took over. A predator that leaves tracks like that, it could be right behind the next patch of trees. I bolted from the clearing, crashing through the woods with no thought but putting distance between me and those goddamn tracks. 
I was nearing the cabin when I smelled it, that rotten meat stink, with a sour, chemical edge to it. It was everywhere, seeping through the trees, making my eyes water. My cabin was up ahead. Maybe if I could reach it, get inside, I'd have a chance. I picked up the pace, but a low inhuman rumble echoed in the forest, silencing the bird song. I burst from the tree lean, rifle clutched tight, and staggered to a halt. My blood ran cold. There was a shape by the cabin, huge and hunched, ripping at something with claws like knives. Even from a distance, I could see the leathery skin pulled taut over bone, the head low to the ground too long in the muzzle. It turned its head towards me, and for a heart-stopping second, those yellow eyes focused on mine. My mind stuttered. That wasn't an animal. It couldn't be. Yet some primal part of me knew it was very real, and very hungry. The thing uncoiled with impossible speed, and the something it had been tearing at finally became clear. The mangled body belonged to Buck Riley, an old trapper who kept to himself. Must have heard the legends, same as me, and didn't believe them either. I didn't wait around to see what it might do to me next. I sprinted for the tree line, fear spurring me on. Behind me came a screech that tore through the air, followed by the pounding of its feet on the ground. I didn't dare look back. Just kept running, branches whipping at my face, lungs burning, until I couldn't run anymore. I collapsed behind a fallen tree, gasping for breath. Night was falling, but I knew I couldn't go back. That creature, it would be waiting. There was no way I could face it and win. I stumbled through the darkness, guided by the stars, half delirious from fear and exhaustion. Didn't stop until I hit the old highway, and by some miracle— flagged down a passing car. Never went back to those woods. Sold the cabin for a pittance. Told the folks who bought it that it was too far from civilization. Didn't feel right being way out there. They laughed, said I was getting soft in my old age. Didn't tell them that sometimes being soft means living long. There was a news report a few weeks later. Couple from New York, hikers, gone missing in that same patch of woods. They never found the bodies. Some nights, I think I can still hear that monstrous scream, and I smell that rot in the air. Makes me wonder how many others are buried up there in the devil's tramping ground, forgotten and mourned by no one. I got lucky. Got a second chance. But some things, once you've seen them, they brand themselves in your brain. They change you. They make you a ghost in your own life, forever haunted by the shadows in the trees. March 23, 2016 Folks around here know me as Tanner, Tanner Scott. Ex-military, did a couple tours back in the sandbox when I was younger and dumber. Now I work as a park ranger, traded the desert heat for the green of the Pacific Northwest forests. I like it quiet, good for clearing your head. Most days out here in the Olympic National Park are pretty uneventful. Hikers getting lost, the occasional wildfire to put out. But sometimes... Sometimes your sense of order in the world gets a good, hard shake. This was one of those times. It started with the reports coming in, sightings of something in the park. I figured it was bored city folks seeing a bear and blowing it out of proportion. But the reports kept coming, too consistent to simply dismiss. Descriptions were all the same, too tall, too skinny, walking on two legs but hunched like an ape, moving too fast for its size, and always glimpsed through the trees at dusk like it was keeping to the shadows. Park HQ got nervous, started sending patrols out in pairs. I teamed up with Brooks, 
another ex-military guy. Figured I could handle anything out there. Turns out, nothing prepares you for the things that exist on the edge of the known world. We were tracking the eastern part of the park, Old Growth Forest. The kind of place where the trees tower over you, and the light can't quite get to the forest floor. That's where we found the campsite. Not one you'd find in any guidebook. The tent was shredded, looked like it had been torn apart by claws. Sleeping bag and supplies were scattered everywhere. A real mess. But no blood. No body. Just a feeling in the air, a prickle on the back of your neck that says something ain't right. We were examining the wreckage when I spotted the track's enormous prints sunk into the soft, needle-covered ground. Not any animal print I recognized. Brooks saw them too, the joking veneer gone, replaced by a tense frown. Whatever made those tracks was big, and walked upright. Something crashed through the trees then, so quick we barely registered it. I caught only a flash of dark, lanky limbs, something massive disappearing into the undergrowth. That's when the smell hit us. Like a rotten egg left in the sun, but with a sickly, chemical sweetness underneath. I gagged. It was wrong on some primal level. Whatever tore up that campsite, it wasn't from around these parts. My instinct screamed at me to run, but training kicked in. I checked my rifle, safety off, while Brooks radioed HQ. His voice was tight as he reported the scene and requested backup. Then we followed those prints deeper into the woods. Twilight was falling fast. The forest got even darker, and I felt like we were being watched from the shadows. Every snap of a branch made me jump. Then up ahead I saw it. Crouched under the branches of an ancient cedar, hunched so low its head was nearly touching its knees. Tall, even hunched over, at least eight feet. The skin looked like old leather stretched too tight over the bone, pale gray under the dying light. The head was small for its body, the face long and almost canine, except for the eyes. Too big, too intelligent, and glowing with a sulfurous yellow light. A low, guttural growl rumbled from its throat. My rifle felt like a damn toy in my hands, useless against something like that. Brooks and I didn't wait. We took off running, crashing through the underbrush, not caring about how much noise we made. We didn't stop until we hit a ranger access road. Radioed HQ again, the adrenaline pumping through my system making my breath come in ragged gasps. Backup arrived, six rangers, armed with shotguns and tasers. Figured they wanted proof, or a body. We led them back to where we saw the creature. It was gone, only those monstrous footprints left as evidence. I could see doubt on the faces of some of the other rangers. They were looking for an easy answer, a cougar, maybe, or an escaped zoo animal. But Brooks and I, we knew what we saw. We spent the rest of that night sweeping the area. Found nothing. It was like whatever that thing was, it had vanished back into the deep dark of the forest. HQ didn't want to shut down the park, couldn't afford the negative press. Told us to be discreet. So, the day trippers came and went, family strolled the paths, oblivious to the fact that the wild parts of the world hold things far stranger and more terrible than they could ever imagine. Didn't take me long to quit after that. Couldn't face going back into the woods, knowing that those yellow eyes might be watching from the trees. Still put the uniform on sometimes, work at a park closer to the city now. But any time I'm in the forest, that rotten smell like death lingers in the back of my throat, and I never, ever look into the shadows too long. They say out here that there's a creature living in those woods, an old native legend. Call it the Sasquatch, if you want. All I know is, it's real, 
and sometimes the stories are better left untold. October 3, 1991. That's when I learned the woods were hiding more than deer and coyotes. Name Zeli. Back then, I was working for the Forest Service up in the Boundary Waters Wilderness in Minnesota. Remote territory, lot of lakes and pines, and more bugs than a man could sweat in a lifetime. I thought I knew it like the back of my hand. I'd bunked in a little ranger outpost, maybe a two-hour hike from the nearest dirt road. My job involved fire patrol, trail maintenance, that sort of thing. Like the solitude, especially after my divorce left me feeling raw and adrift. Nature seemed steadier somehow. Late September, I came across something strange. Found a deer carcass picked clean to the bone up in a cluster of pines. Nothing unusual about that. Wolves, mountain lions, they all gotta eat. But this was tidier somehow. Like something had stripped the meat with surgical precision, leaving nary a tooth mark behind. Didn't add up. I shrugged it off, attributing it to my newbie eyes not used to the backcountry rhythm. A few days later, I was taking stock of bear sightings reported by campers. One caught my eye. Some guy and his kids swore they saw something massive moving through the trees one night, described it as being upright, walking like a man. But they claimed it was covered in fur, with a face more animal than human. Didn't give it much thought then, figured they were overreacting, spooked by the dark. Told them as much in my professional ranger voice. But then, late one night out on patrol, I heard it. A low growl that turned into a roar, echoing off the lake. Too deep for any animal I knew. Sent a chill down my spine. I was armed with a standard issue point thirty dash zero six rifle, good for most things, but against whatever made that noise, seemed about as useful as a slingshot. My grandpappy, bless his old soul, always said there are things out in the woods you ain't meant to understand. Guess that night I learned his words rang true. Next morning, I reported back to the main station, told my boss about what I'd been seeing and hearing. He had that look rangers get when they think you've been out in the sun too long. Told me to lay off the whiskey. I don't even drink the stuff and get back to work. Prideful jerk, always had been. Didn't listen. Took a longer hike into the woods than usual the next day, keeping my eyes peeled for any tracks, fur, anything off. Found something, all right, a footprint pressed deep into the mud near the lake shore. It was the size of a dinner plate and had five toes, but long, curved into claws. My granddad would have crossed himself and muttered something about the devil walking the earth. That night I didn't sleep. I sat at my cabin window, rifle across my lap. Every rustle of leaves, every creak of wood sounded like something creeping closer. Around midnight, movement out on the shoreline. I held my breath, strained my eyes in the dark. It was a massive shape, hunched over, easily seven feet tall and twice as wide as any man. Thick, dark fur covered it, but I could see long, powerful arms beneath. Couldn't make out a face in the darkness, but damn sure felt its eyes on me, cold and calculating. It stood there, still as a tree, for what seemed like hours. I didn't dare move, didn't even blink. Finally, slowly, it turned back towards the woods, crashing off into the underbrush. I didn't exhale until the sounds faded away entirely. Next morning, I packed my things, radioed that I was coming in. Got the brush off from the boss again, told to stick to my duties or there'd be consequences. Walked out of the wilderness that day and never went back. Didn't explain, couldn't explain. 
They'd have locked me up in a padded room, figured I was crazy. I settled into a more sensible job, working as a fire lookout in a tower where I could see trouble coming from miles away. Couple weeks later, a story popped up on the news. Camper gone missing in the Boundary Waters, just north of my area. They never recovered his body. Found his tent ripped to shreds, and blood spatter all over the trees like someone had used the place for a canvas. They blamed it on a rogue bear. I knew better. Sometimes, just sometimes, there are things out in the deep woods that maps don't show. Things smarter, stronger, and a whole lot hungrier than us. Things they call skinwalkers. Yeah, maybe that's it. That ain't a name any ranger will admit knowing. But the way it lurks in the shadows, the way it changes shape to prey on fear, it fits the damn thing I saw.